It's not my imagination. I gotta get him a bag. Hey, what's going on? Welcome. Am I coming in a little hot? Hot to trot? I can't tell. I can never tell on this mic. Welcome to the show tonight. Happy New Year. This is the first live streaming show of the new year. Took a couple days off to sort of regroup a little bit. Got a great episode planned for tomorrow night. More on that later. But tonight's show is all about the beef. And this is a heavy beef episode. I mean, this is a this is a whole slaughterhouse full of beef. I mean, this is this is a big one. And I want to start off right away by saying a couple things. One, uh, a lot of this stuff is uh, alleged. It's alleged stuff. I don't know the precise details and facts. So I'm going to try and insert that word alleged alleged as much as possible into the stream. Um, but I'm putting it here at the beginning, a disclaimer that a lot of this stuff that I'm talking about should be taken with a complete grain of salt. I Ultimately, I and we, we don't know what the truth is. And that this is merely conjecture. A lot of this is conjecture from YouTube streaming podcast nerd. That's it. So putting that out there. Second thing I want to say, I, you know, I consider myself to be incredibly scholarly about the misfits. I think a lot of you would agree with that, that, you know, I could talk, I mean, I could talk about the misfits right, right off the top of my head. And, you know, um, same thing with the Beatles, with a lot of stuff. Um, Black Flag is not a topic that I'm scholarly about. I can talk about the Ramones in a scholarly way. Black Flag is not um, totally in my wheelhouse. So a lot of I'm going to be leaning on other sources of information as I, you know, I'm not I'm not speaking from a, a super knowledgeable place. I just want to put all of that out there before I start talking. And and we dive into this. I, I, you know, I know some stuff, but I am not super deeply well versed in the band. And I truly, I welcome, especially in the comments or in the comment in the, you know, comments under the video after this broadcast happens. What's going on, Aaron? Um, you know, anybody to correct me or to weigh in or throw throw in their two cents. Okay, just welcoming all that. Uh, we're talking about Black Flag. Hermosa Beach Band out of California in the 70s. You have two, you have two big movements, right? I mean, you have you have two sort of uh, what's going on, Thomas. Glad you love the podcast. Why don't you why don't you hop on over to YouTube to join us? Um, easier to see your comments that way. You ha I mean, you have a lot of different, you know, punk rock epicenters sort of going down, but I would say that. You know, probably the two biggest, at least in, in in the states, are New York and L.A. <laughs> and by the way, I just want to say, uh, Greg, Greg Ginn might be a genius, but we will definitely be we will be very unbiased towards his genius. Let's put it that way. We are not going to be uh, walking on eggshells about any of this stuff, alleged stuff. Um. So you have. You have the L.A. scene, one of the biggest bands in the L.A. scene. You know, we talk about like big bands. I think if you're going to list punk bands off the top of your head, you know, you might say the Sex Pistols. You'll say the Clash. You'll say the Ramones. I think you would definitely say the Misfits. Nowadays, people would say the Stooges, maybe not, you know, 15, 20 years ago. 20 years ago, they wouldn't. 15 years ago, they would. But one of those bands is going to be Black Flag. Everybody knows who black flag is um i would argue that probably with within the entirety of of punctum henry rollins the the pro, the most famous front and long long tenured front man of black flag is one of the the highest profile punk rock sort of icons to sort of break through into the mainstream right like Henry Rollins sort of transcended 
the the punk underground hardcore whatever and became an actor he's in movies he's a character actor and all this stuff you know he's speaking at colleges all that sort of thing you're, you're very welcome jody um so you know henry is so and then associated with that much like the misfits you know crimson ghost i'm already butchering this thing <laughs> Sorry, I'm doing the best I can. Um, associated with the with the Crimson Ghost is is the uh, or or right up there along with the Crimson Ghost is the the Black Flag bars. This is the, one of the most iconic punk logos: the Ramones crest, the Misfits fiend fiend skull, and you know Crimson Ghost and and uh, the, the 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 punk rock barcode as they call it, the the Black Flag itself. Uh, super iconic. All come. From Black Flag. Black Flag were, I think, one of the things that made Black Flag not only uh, what what's kept them, you know, enduring for as long as they have was their work ethic. I mean, one of the hardest working bands there ever was, you know, just endlessly, endlessly, endlessly grinding. When they weren't rehearsing, they were recording. When they weren't recording, they were out on the road. They called their tour the Creepy Crawl. And the creepy crawl would go all across the United States. You know, they went to Europe. They went all over Europe. They'd come back. You know, they, 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 you know, go all around. Henry had that tattoo, the creepy crawl. He has the spider and then it says creepy crawl on it. Um, so, I mean, they're, they are just, they're just, and you know, what's funny too. I, I think black flag is more famous for Henry Rollins being in the band and all that stuff I just mentioned and the, 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 the logo more than the music, because anybody who actually listens to black flag or, you know, uh, anybody who, who might know who black flag is might not be able to list like beyond 10 songs. And that is not, that is not to, that's not like a diss or like, that's not, that's not like some sort of like elitist thing. I don't know if I could name 10 black flag songs off the top of my head. I don't want to, I think I can I, I can, I can, uh, you know, uh, uh, TV party, six pack depression, room 13, nervous breakdown, no values, uh, jealous again, revenge, police story, um, uh, family man, my war, I love you, loose nuts, slip it in. I, I can name, I can name a bunch of songs. I know their, I know their discography. I'm not, I'm not super big personally. I am not a super big black black flag fan there's a handful of songs that i really i love depression i love room 13 i love revenge i love the song nervous breakdown i love i love you i love my war i love loose nut those are some black flag songs that i really thoroughly enjoy black coffee um and what's interesting is they are also a band that sort of has as many members as the misfits do and you know much like the misfits like we were talking about like like brian damage right like uh brain damage the uh brian damage keats who who was the, the final misfits drummer technically who only played like you know not even a half a set with the misfits at their final show and when he passed away that was all that he was known for despite being in a handful of bands because like that is your identity. If you are in this band, you are known as a misfit. Like it's kind of like being made in the mafia. We've talked about that before. And it's kind of like that with black flag. Like everybody who's in black flag, like you're in an outfit, you're in the club. You are in the mafia. If you are in black flag, that, that's what I mean by that. X black flag, X black flag, like that kind of thing. Um, even though Keith, Keith Morris was a founding member and was with the band for the first two years, but only appears on a single EP, you know, compared to all the other singers, you know, that's a really, see, again, the, coming from a place of someone who is not thoroughly the expert, I was going to say that even him, he, when people think Keith Morris, the first thing they say before I think even circle jerks is black flag. And when you look at his involvement with those two bands, he was, I mean, he's, he, he, he is the circle jerks along with uh, what's his face. Um, Greg Hudson. Um, while in, while black flag, there's just, he's just that first chapter 
of Black Flag, but people always put that like ahead of everything, you know, before Circle Jerks, I would even say it's Black Flag, that kind of thing. Um, so that's kind of interesting how how that is how that is. And so you have you have there are so many members of Black Flag. There's probably 20, I'm sure there's 20 off the top of my head, something like that. Um, I'll get to the comments, comments guys in a little bit. I'm just trying to stay, stay on track here. Keep myself straight. Cause there's a lot to discuss. So there's the big, so I, I would say the, the biggest beef here that, that we will be sort of looking at is Greg Ginn versus everybody else. So here's the thing. Now we have to talk about, so black flag was around from 76 to 86. However, they were, they weren't actually Black Flag until 78. That's when they released the Nervous Breakdown EP. Before that, they were kind of this band called Panic, right? And they had already been through a handful of bassists before Chuck Dukowski joined. Uh, Gary McDaniel turned into Chuck Dukowski in 78. As a matter of fact, if you have a, there is a super rare uh, version of Nervous Breakdown. It's, um, it's before they put the black flag logo bars on it. The, the very first pressing, they only pressed 2000 of them. And if you have one of those that doesn't even have, he's not even, he's not even credited as Chuck, Chuck, Duk 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 uh, Chuck Dukowski. He's accredited as Gary McDaniels he changed his name to Chuck Dukowski. He got it from a lighter from what was Chuck, the Duke to Dukowski really cool. Last name, Re really big fan of that, that sort of stage name. Um, and you know, if, if, uh, if Greg Ginn is the brains, the mastermind behind black flag, I guess it's often said that Chuck Dukowski was the heart in black flag. And therefore that's like the nucleus of the original band. And, you know, they would swap out singers and drummers, but that was, it was always that guitar and bass combo. They basically started SST records SST before it was a record before it was a record label. It was, it was an electronics manufacturer that Greg Ginn had, had actually started. He used to make uh, radios, radios like ham radios, stuff like that. People would see, you know, people come to black flag shows like the later ones, like the super lame ones, like the, the, the much, much later ones. Uh, you can see which side of the fence I'm on here. Um, and they would get those, those, those radios signed by greg because has the sst logo on it you know um and so the, these are the two this is like the nucleus so black flag even though panic had started as early uh, you know the 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 concept that the idea what they were doing had started as early as 1976 and you know raymond pettibon i'm not sure if i pronounced that right uh that's that's greg ginn's brother who did who's done all the artwork for all of the black flag records he um he was the first bassist and then spot producer he was the bassist for a while and he would go on to engineer and produce uh earth ad by the misfits misfits and and black flag they share some commonalities uh between drummers and you know at least glenn danzig does glenn danzig drum had robo as a drummer and he had chuck biscuits as a drummer so um so, I mean, they had been through a bunch of bassists and they had been through, uh, they were already on their second drummer. Robo was the second drummer in Black Flag. I don't know the name of the first one. I, I don't remember his name. Like I said, not an expert here. Um, and they sort of, they sort of formed, they formed this label. So, I mean, this is important to sort of remember. They, you know, uh, that, that Chuck was, Chuck was there and so was Greg. And then Keith comes into the picture. I think actually Keith had been in panic before they they called themselves Black Flag. I think Chuck came after Keith. But the label, the label that was SST Records, which released Nervous Breakdown, which was the first release, I believe. Don't quote me on that. Again, not sure. Someone correct me if, if I'm wrong. Um, that was, that's when Chuck, Chuck became a partial owner of the, of the band. Um, so, okay. Sorry. <laughs> Already in the bottle. No, there's so much, there's so much to look at. All right. So, so that's like the, that's like the, the foundation 
of, of everything. And then here's what happens. And this is the, the pattern, as we said. The, the first beef that we're looking at, the main beef, there's like other little beefs, but they're not as major as like, you know, all bands have like inter, you know, politics and, you know, this, that, and the other. The real riff, the real beef is between Greg Ginn and all of Black Flag. And the way it works is this. Um, people come into Black Flag, the members would come into Black Flag and they would, you know, they would just sort of, I heard Henry talk about this in a podcast. You get into Black Flag and you'd be there and you'd be with Greg, you'd work with Greg. And if you stayed past your expiration date, everybody had an expiration date with Greg Ginn. That's what would happen. You know, you would kind of expire in his eyes and then he would push you out and bring in someone new. And that's just how he would work. And he was the He's the one constant from 76 all the way up until the, 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 the patchwork reunion, like, you know, things that he was trying to, you know, do, uh, Greg Ginn is the only member. So there's like a huge contingent of fans that consider Greg Ginn is black flag, right? That's what they say. You'll always hear that. I, this is something that I hear all the time, you know, in the division camp, you know, on one side, the loyalists to, to Ginn, they go, Ginn is black flag. So whoever Ginn has in the band. And under the name Black Flag is legitimate, but here's herein lies the problem. So, so now we're we're coming to uh, well, let me put a pin in that for one second. Sorry, trying to keep myself organized, doing this off the top of my head here. Um, so like I said, there's a pattern. Every time uh, you know something would happen with members, and they get pushed out, and then someone else would come in, someone else would come in, and eventually the the uh, it, it sort of reached a, a culmination, a peak in 1986. And we'll, we'll have to, we'll have to read, read, read about that now. Let's do it now, actually. So the first, I would say that, I mean, members were, were always coming and going. They had four lead singers. Keith Morris left initially because of Chuck Dukowski, you know, Chuck, when Chuck gets into the band and he had been in a band called Worm, spelled W-U-R-M. And they shared a practice, I believe, again, don't quote me, maybe it was a different different Dukowski band. They shared the practice space at the church with Panic. And that's how those guys all met. The church was like a, a place where they, you see it in the Decline of Western Civilization movie. That's a place where everybody's hanging out. You know, in, in uh, Penelope Spears, she's interviewing everybody in the church, which is just like, which was Black Flag, you know, headquarters. Where they where they slept and rehearsed and yada yada yada. Um. So okay, hold on, hold on. Trying to get there. Trying to think about this uh, chronologically because I didn't write anything down properly. Because I'm a moron. They um the first bit. So people are coming and going. Like I said. Oh right, Keek. Right. Sorry. Uh, Chuck Dukowski. Now I remember where I was. Thank you, Chuck Dukowski. Enters the band, the work, the work ethic just um, increases because partially I, because of Chuck. That was what Chuck sort of seemed to bring to Black Flag, and before that, the band, or at least up until a certain point, you know, um, with Keith and Keith and Greg being technically the original founding members from Panic. Uh, although, again, I would I, I think the band is founded and you have to consider Chuck Dukowski a founding member. They become black flag when Chuck Dukowski enters the band. That's what, that's what's like, like that's what synthesizes the band. So it's the same thing with, you know, the misfits were always talking about, Oh, well, you know, Diane D Piazza was there before Jerry. It's like, dude, the misfits became the misfits when Jerry, Manny and Glenn came together and synthesized. You know what I'm saying? Um, so, all right, hold on. Uh, uh, so then Keith Morris left because Dukowski couldn't stand the work ethic. It was too much for him, man. It was too much for him to handle. So he bounced and he went on and he went and formed the Circle Jerks with, with um, Greg Henson, who was in Red Cross, right? He's in Red Cross. This is like a endurance trial of memory. <laughs> I'm trying so hard to remember this. So he, uh, he, he, so they formed the Circle Jerks, uh, and then they bring in, um, Ron Ray's, who was a fan 
Ron was a fan. I don't know if I'm saying his last name right. Ron was a big fan. So was Des. Des was a fan as well. And, you know, Bill Stevenson is sort of hanging around because he knew Keith Morris since he was eight years old, right? They, they go way back because, because Keith Morris's dad owned a bait shop, bait and tackle shop. And, and Bill was a fisherman. He was, a, since he was a little boy. So he was always in that store, you know, so he knew Keith as well. So in matter of fact, I think the second black flag show was the first descendant show. The sentence opened for black flag on their second show. And that was in 77. That was that with uh, Tony Lombardo and what's the other guy, the other guy, the, the um, guitar player, Frank, maybe I forget his name. So in any case, Ron joins the band. Ron exits the band like six months later. They, you know, they, they, they give him that moniker on jealous again. Des joins the band. Des moves over to rhythm guitar. Henry joins the band. Like there's a lot of shuffling. A lot of people leave. They had this drummer named Emil for a while. They had Chuck biscuits for a whole year in 82, which is, you know, they, they couldn't record because of a beef with unicorn studios. They had Chuck biscuits on the drums. He bounced. That's when Bill Stevenson came in and they recorded my war. Right. And by that time, that's when that's when the first big, I would say the first big true change to Black Flag really comes. Because up to this point, they're kind of performing, you know, material. They're they're performing the material that's on damaged, right? And they um that that's when like the first big shift happens and they push out Dukowski. And we're gonna read about that right now. And spray paint the walls. This is the only book I've ever read about Black Flag. Um, a lot of my knowledge, some of my knowledge, working knowledge comes from it. It's by Stevie Chick. It's a really good read. A lot of uh, the guy does done really done his research. Uh, I know that Greg Ginn does not like this book. He he thinks it's full of inaccuracies. It's taken. It takes from Henry's tour journals and a lot of uh, just a lot of um, a lot of good research went into this book. I think. And yes, get in the van is a great is is fantastic. Big fan of get in the van. Oh, here we go. So early panic rehearsal, 1978. Chuck Dukowski was in panic. I'm sorry. You have Chuck Dukowski, Robo, Keith Morris, and Greg Ginn. Right. So they were panic even when, and then at some point they they changed the name to Black Flag. Well, we know when that happens. I'm not gonna. We're not gonna go through that though. What we're looking for here. What we're looking for here is when the Duke gets pushed out of Black Flag. And this is the first time that, this is the first time that Greg takes someone who's super major and super integral to his circle and operation. Because everything, because Greg is the nucleus, right? Someone I've, someone up someone up here who said that Greg in is Black Flag. Here, Black Flag since 1985, the year I was born, by the way. <laughs> Greg, uh, uh, Greg in is black flag. And, and there's a lot of people that agree with Chris that like, will say the same thing. Greg in is black flag. Lots of people contribute, but creatively Glenn is the sound of black flag. I, I mean, I, I would, I agree with that 75%, you know, um, I guess he, I mean, he's not wrong. He's, he's, he's not wrong, but there it's, I think it's more to it than that. So let, okay. So, so this is where, this is where the Duke gets, I look at this. I even put little, little post-it notes so I could read from the, the right spots. Okay. It's reading time. I'm going to take off the, I'm going to take off my glasses for this so I can read properly. This is just really annoying to read with the glasses on. I'll do it. Um, yes, I'm showing my age guys, but listen, it doesn't matter what age you get into something. It's the age of the internet. We all like, we all know the same information at this point. I guarantee that, you know, if you got into black flag in 1985 or 86 or whatever, that you didn't know as much as you know now about black flag because of the internet and books and yada, yada, yada. I mean, it's just like, that's what happens, you know, um, of all the songs from Black Flag's 1982 demo with Chuck Biscuits, this is on page 282 for anybody who has the book and wants to read, read along. Of all the songs from Black Flag's 1982 demo with Chuck Biscuits on drums, My War seemed the most obviously anthemic, a vicious, 
rancorous beast that distilled all of the angst and black feeling of damaged one and its many live rewrites into a fiercely cro magnon stomper well uh that welded the low end riffage of black sabbath to black flag's sophisticated steamroller vision of hardcore structurally the song segued is that segued segged between full-on riffing and passages of broken down squall why are we talking about my war because it's very it's very like integral to the moment that that chuck dukowski leaves the band i and chuck is not on to chuck wrote my war but he's not on the track he doesn't play bass it's actually played by a fellow named dale nixon who doesn't actually exist actually he does in 2003 he becomes a drum machine but in 1983, he is the alter alter ego of Greg Ginn, who also played bass uh, on My War, and Bill Stevenson was the drummer. Structurally, the song segged between full-on riffages, blah, 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 we already said that, uh, and passages of Broken Down Squall, where Greg's guitar solos wailed and roared with twisted brilliance. The violence with which the song tore from these ugly lakes of noise, lumbering dinosaur riffs, toiling doomily to the rocketing full pelt passages, Chuck revving his bass and giving it, did he, wait, no, but Chuck didn't play bit. Maybe he did. Maybe I'm wrong. I don't remember this part. Chuck revving his bass and giving it in the full lemmy, evoked the lyrics bipolar hurdle between hatred and self-hatred, the war in question was one waged on all about them, but also upon themselves. The song's circular lyric summed up much of the paranoia and anguish that had built up within the group thanks to the lawsuit that had hung over them for so long. In my war, life is constant conflict and every friend is just an enemy in waiting. You're one of them spat Rollins accusingly. And it's like one of Henry's best performances in black flag as a singer. I mean, he really, it's a, it's a great, it's really, really great. Yes. We have a snow day tomorrow. Yes. I just got a text message that it's going to make pancakes. Um, you're one of them makes me want to listen to the song right now spat rollins accusingly over and over in the song's breakdowns he babbled an improvised sociopathic spiel and sometimes just howled wounded and raging the bile and panic in his voice is chilling this guy is really really good at at uh writing about music uh morg says you really can't have black flag without gin's guitar i i agree I, I do not disagree there. He's just too unique. It's a bummer that he had to hold the band hostage with his guitar. I'm on team Chuck team, everybody, but again, he is BF. See, even people that are team flag still say that Gin is BF. It's a very, it's, this is a very interesting beef and sort of like the, the mechanics here are really, really interesting. And it's an interesting sort of uh, anomaly in uh, some of the previous case studies we've done about what makes a band a band. And we're going to get into that too, but I have, Oh my God, this is going to be such a long episode. I don't want this to be a long episode, but I can already tell that we're just, we're just, we're just knee deep in it. I really feel like we should have read the lyrics to what my war is, but we all know what they are. My war was an obvious choice for the first album. Black flag would cut following the collapse of the unicorn embargo. So what is the unicorn emb embargo? I, I'm going to, try and nutshell this as quickly as possible. And I don't, I'm not, I'm not even going to use all the information because I don't know all the information. Unicorn records. It was a record studio and a record label. And I believe they put out damaged one. Uh, they did the distribution for SST. Maybe, I don't know. Could be wrong there. They had had, they had a contract with Uni with black flag. There was a disagreement. Something happened. I don't remember what it's in this book. I read about it. I just don't remember what it was. And the um, basically contractually black flag was not allowed to release any music as black flag. So what they would do, they were in a lawsuit and they would, they toured so much in the year 1982, they just kept touring and all that money went into this lawsuit 
against Unicorn. And they were just trying to break their contract or break out. And they had written so much material. That's why in 84 alone, I think there's three albums that come out in 84, right? 83 is My War. And then 84, you have uh, Slip It In, Loose Nut. What's the third one? Family Man, maybe? I, they they all just maybe it's not no not family man loose nut what is it loose nut or is it my is is it my war I no no I guess it would be my I don't know I don't know someone correct me on that please point is is that they they had all this material and it just sort of popped out and by that time they had they were evolving and that's that's when the band really falls off for me though when they just get into that sludgy metal stuff that slow and instrumental i just can't i can't comprehend that i just i know there are a lot of black flag fans that like love that stuff not my thing now i like the earlier stuff the more punk punky stuff um but that's the thing about black flag they were always they were they were never looking back they were always pushing forward just like glenn danzig and 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 his progression Glenn Danzig never looked back. You know, he would fold songs. He would fold older songs into the set list of his new bands. He would take Misfit songs and put them in Sam Hain set lists. And then he would take those. He'd take some Sam Hain songs and some Misfit songs and then fold that into the early Danzig set list when he didn't have enough Danzig material. But like, you know, uh, yes, this is live. Johnny Bob Goldstein, you are live. Welcome. And I, I'm sorry to ignore all the um the the uh comments i just i'm trying to stay on point but i'm just gonna say yeah okay so so chris who's been a fan since 85 does agree that spray paint the walls is a good great read that's awesome that's awesome it's good they broke up in 86 it was over uh gins revivals sound sad they do they really do we're going to talk about that so i mean chris's chris's uh uh, again purist but he even he recognizes that the revivals are terrible there are some gin purists that don't who are just so blind they're so blindly devoted to to the ginness of it all i i personally i think gin is a real jerk i think he's a genius but i think he's a real jerk uh, I, from all the stuff that i've read all the things that he's allegedly done um i just don't want to speak out of turn in case i i might be wrong about something so the unicorn thing so so they're they're out there like touring that's when Duca uh, that's when biscuits is in the band and they are they are just touring and then i think he moved over to the circle jerks i mean he played with everybody chuck biscuits man what a career well, i wish he would put out a book um th but in any case they just would they were just touring and touring and touring they wanted to release music eventually they did release something called everything went black and it was Chuck Dukowski who actually went to jail. He he was uh, the court. He was in contempt of court over that lawsuit and went to jail for releasing music when they weren't supposed to be releasing music, something like that. And then in 83, they had that big Santa Monica show where there were thousands of people that showed up over the summer of 83. That's when the Misfits, one of the final Misfits shows, that's when the Misfits <gasps> opened up for Black Flag. Uh, one of the biggest shows that the Misfits had done up until that point. Um, in any case, let's get back to this this reading real quick. So that's what the the unicorn embargo is a statement of the group's strength, their cockroach like ability to outlive all the adversaries and the irie and the anger that fueled it, and sometimes united them. The group finally recorded my war. Okay, never mind. So. So, so yeah, so he is not on the recording, but of course he played the song live because they were playing that song. They were playing that song in 82 before 83. So of course he would be, of course, Chuck uh, Dukowski was playing on it, right? Um, the, the group finally recorded My War for the second Black Flag album for which it was the opening title track uh, would, however, scarcely resemble uh, that which cut the demo so the demo version is different i don't think i've heard the de that's with chuck biscuits it says right here chuck biscuits had long ago been replaced by bill stevenson they had done a demo a, a whole demo i think it's like uh 13 songs with chuck biscuits on drums and those are the only recordings of chuck biscuits with black flag apart from live recordings but bill stevenson is now and bill you know this is when bill starts to really uh, become an engineer and a producer because 
for those of you who don't know, the blasting room out in Colorado, that's Bill's uh that's Bill's outfit. And he is a he is a maverick genius uh producer and engineer. And you know, he he had a uh, friggin' uh good luck with your good luck with your magic tournament, Aaron. That's awesome. I really want to get my son into that magic. That's a lot of fun. Enjoy yourself. Good luck. Hope you win. Um but yeah, uh, Bill Stevenson had had uh, come into the fold. And like I said, he, he when he started recording with them and did My My War and all those albums, that's when he really started to get interested and into the studio and stuff. Um, and just would become like a, a what you would call it a, a prodigy of of that sort of of that sort of ilk. How do you how do you pronounce Dez's last name? Is it Kadena or Kadenya? Kadena, Kadena. Dez, I'll just call him Dez, meanwhile, had bowed out of Black Flag following the reunion show. Now, when they call it a reunion show, this is what we're talking about, Santa Monica Civic, which was promoting the everything went back, went back, blah, blah, everything went black, which is the first four years. What does that mean? It means that it, it was a compilation that featured uh, unreleased recordings of, of Keith Morris songs. That, that has Keith Morris doing like gimme, gimme, gimme and depression and stuff like that. It has Ron Ray's. It has Dez and as Henry all on this thing. And they coincided the release with a concert at uh, Santa Monica Civic. And everybody came out. Keith Morris did not come out here. It talks about it here. Um, Dez, meanwhile, had bowed out of Black Flag following the reunion show. Uh, the sideman and former vocalist wanted to form a group of his own. Finally, the man who had penned the song and who had helped steer the group from its beginnings in church through the unicorn brouhaha and out the other end exited the group before getting to record uh, what was possibly his greatest song with Black Flag. That's they're talking about Chuck now. They're not talking about um, Des. But the, the writer, finally, the man. Yeah. My war, says Chuck Dukowski, is about Greg Yen. He he makes no bones about this. So you know what I love? They have like a little number after every quote, and then they show you. They cite exactly where that quote was taken from. Really great. So Chuck doesn't mince any words. My war is about Greg Yen. If you want to listen to my war and know what he's singing about, he's singing about Greg Yen and his relationship with Greg Yen. As a matter of fact, every, you know, runner, everything, everything went black is the only black flag CD. I think I own like in physical form. Um, Henry says that Chuck was vibed out of the group. The official reason was that Greg felt Chuck's skills as a bassist weren't up to the songs that without Des adding a second guitar, Greg was having to hold down the rhythm of the songs himself. Now, a lot of people, a lot of people um, are, have been saying in the comments, I've been like looking over the comments. A lot of you guys are saying, uh, Gin is black. Gin is black flag. Gin is black flag. Gin is not only the principal songwriter. Gin is, Gin is a, a guitarist on a whole nother level. You know, when we talk about like, we, we're always talking about like, you know, the best guitarists or great guitarists, or whatever. Gin is in a class of guitarists, like so above any of his contemporaries. You know, it's like he, he really is. It, he is something to behold when you're watching. Like, I've never seen him live, but I've definitely I've just just been in awe of watching him shred on YouTube and just been blown away by his his style and how the notes just pour out of him. They completely pour out of Greg Ginn. He just sort of, you know, speaking of physical releases, I have Greg Ginn's solo CD that I think he put out in the 90s with Epitaph. Could I be wrong? Maybe it was SSD. In any case, so the official reason for Chuck being pushed out was because he just technically couldn't keep up. Now, here's what's interesting, though, and we'll, we'll look at this in the interviews. We'll look at this in the interviews. Matter of fact, maybe we should... We should jump over now because we can't just keep reading. All right, we'll read a little bit more. 
So he says, uh, rhythmically, Chuck was very wild, adds Rollins, more like a lead guitar player. So that's an interesting way to put it. You know, they there you hear all the time about uh, guitar players that that switch over to bass and then they play bass like a guitar player or you'll hear like, oh, that guy isn't really, you know, when you think of bass, you generally think of a rhythm instrument that might be sitting in the pocket, holding, holding things down. Right. Um, but then you have outliers out there that are doing all sorts of, I mean, in other genres of music, you wouldn't consider like, like funk, the bass isn't sitting in the pocket reggae. The bass is the, is leading things. It's the guitar. That's the rhythm. The guitar is doing the up, up, take the, ch -ch -ch -ch. that's all rhythm. It's all rhythm guitar. And you have the bass is, is what's driving everything. Um, you look at Paul McCartney, who was a guitar player who had switched over to bass. Paul, if you listen to isolated bass tracks of the Beatles later on in the last few years, of the Beatles existence, Paul's not even repeating himself. He's a rhythm. He's, he's trying to, he's holding the rhythm down. He's not even repeating. He's not repeating. I mean, this is insanity. To do something like that. So you have these outliers that go like above and beyond. And it's interesting how the, 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 um, the author here says that Chuck is more like a lead guitar player than he is just, you know, keeping the rhythm. Listen to the bass lines. He wasn't laying down rhythms. He was all over the neck. And this drove Gin nuts. At the time we started working on my war, Greg said, I'm having a real hard time with Chuck. I'm having to play to the drums. I'm not a rhythm player. I'm a lead player. Sometimes we'd practice can't decide all afternoon. Gin's music had all these off time holds. It was not straight time. He insisted gimme, gimme, gimme was never played properly. Greg, Bill, and Chuck would do the intros to the songs. I'd be there with the mic waiting for the vocal, and Gin would say, no, come on, come on, Chuck. You'd see Chuck practicing to, uh, to a click track, trying to get himself more in line. Finally, they could no longer play together, so Chuck said, I'm quitting. I'm going to manage the band. Greg asked me to leave Black Flag. He said it was, it was him or me, says Chuck. I felt like I didn't have a choice. After Greg told me I was out of the band, I went back to Germany to clear out the house of my grandmother who had died. I remember sitting in the attic thinking everything I've worked for, it's gone. I was just going to walk away. I even thought about staying in Germany, per Germany permanently, even though I can't really speak the language anymore. When I came back, I prepared to make a new life for myself outside of SST and Black Flag. It was very hard. But when Greg asked me to continue running the label with him and I, uh, but Greg asked me to continue running the label with him. And I agreed. I think he found he needed me to run it. It's a complicated job. I like running the label. I enjoy the business side of music. I had invested so much of myself in SST already. I felt okay about it. I had invested so much. Uh, I had a big role in signing the bands for SST, the Minutemen, the Meat Puppets, the Descendants, Sonic Youth, Dinosaur Jr., Husker do sound garden and more. I am so proud to have played a part in signing those bands. We had such a great group of musicians. It's really a shame that most of them ultimately had problems with SST. Now it's interesting to note. Here's another interesting note about that. Take a look at SST. SST is still going. It's never stopped, but look what happens. Dukowski leaves the label like for good in 1989, all of those bands, the, like the creme de la creme of SST, it was all in the eighties. What happened? What came out of the nineties? It was all that's after that's all gin. So like Dukowski is so integral in the signing of good, talented music. You know, it's just interesting. Interesting to note that, 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 uh, that switch over as well. So in the immediate aftermath of Chuck's exit, Rollins considered tendering his resignation from the flag and starting a group of his own with Chuck. I said, do you want me to come with you? Remembers Henry, because at that point I was more in line with Dukowski spiritually. 
He was more the My War guy. Greg was the Loose Nut, later Flag album guy. Both were cool, but they were two clearly different brains going on. One guy was going for the Darwinian Nietzschean thing, while the other was going for the more introverted, intellectual, less tactile Gin thing. Chuck was about getting the blood flowing. When I said, do you want me to go with you? He answered, no, you should stay in Black Flag. So I did. Uh, Dukowski says, I felt a kinship with Henry and more so uh, and more so than Keith or Des. I felt Henry knew how to sing my songs. Keith is a great singer for Wasted, but not so much for my war or what I see. Henry and I spoke with the same emotional language. You know, Chuck, Chuck took Henry in under his wing. Chuck was the guy who decided that he should be in the band and took him in under under his wing. It was like, you know, his his little brother in a weird kind of way, in that kind of way. Um. He says, they're all great singers, just that Henry was easier to write for. So it was a horrible shame that I had lost all that I had worked for so hard in Black Flag, just as I was hitting my stride. Henry offered to leave Black Flag and start something else with me when I left. I think it was a mistake. I didn't do it. It might have been. Could you imagine what that would have looked like? That would have been very interesting. Greg Ginn pushed out every member of Black Flag until he got to Henry and realized that he was too popular to replace. That's what I was waiting to get to. And I just didn't want to do a bad job of saying it. Ultimately, we were just talking about before I started reading about how 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 Dukowski left the band. You know, you have you have this you have this situation where Gin is black flag. He is the the, the core of the center. But what happens with Henry Rollins is that. Henry starts doing the spoken word thing. He steps outside of the black flag paradigm. Unlike everybody else, even Chuck Dukowski, all of them existed solely in black flag. And so it was easy for Gin to go, I'm black flag. You no longer suit my needs. I'm pushing you away. I'm pushing you out. I'm, I'm kicking you out. But with Henry, it wasn't so simple. Because Why? Because Henry was his own entity and this is what we were talking about with at the very very beginning of this stream where henry rollins is like the henry rollins is like the the only guy in the in the whole punk space to transcend punk people who don't know a th single thing about punk music know who henry rollins is for everything for his acting work and just everything else that he does you know, he transcended that. And even when he was still in Black Flag and started doing the spoken word thing and were and were, you know, and was coming up and like, you know, coming up in the ranks. When Gin wanted him gone, he couldn't do so. So what did Gin do? He quit the band. That was his only move. He couldn't push Henry out because he he knew that he needed Henry in order to be Black Flag by that point. Henry was just as much of black flag as he was. He was at that point. And so what did he do? He killed his creation and he was more invested. He had, he started to really get into instrumental stuff. He had another band called gone that was opening for black flag on those last tours in 86. And the guys from gone, I believe the rhythm section, the drummer and the bass player, they went on and they formed a band with Henry right after 87. Um, Greg at blah, 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 blah. Greg pushed every member out until he got to Henry and realized he was too popular to replace. It's true. Continues Chuck. When he pushed me out of black flag, my life with the band had become so miserable that there was an element of relief. I really regret that I didn't see through Greg's maneuvering. He is a destructive person. I think my will was just broken. There was something that happened. Things turned. Henry described it as like a cult, and I think there's an element of truth to that. There was such a terrible, vicious atmosphere, so cruel. Chuck's exit from the group left members of the wider Black Flag family reeling and in shock. Now, you've heard, I forget in what, which interview, maybe it was the Pusset interview, you've heard Glenn Danzig even say, when Chuck left, Flag was never the same. He's like, it's not Black Flag without Chuck. You know, so so that there's definitely, you know, 
uh, that that's some of that reeling in shock. I was completely shattered and heartbroken when I heard that Dukowski was no longer in the group. Remembered Glenn Friedman. They were looking for a new bass player. And I thought, what, what happened to Chuck? Did he get hurt? Oh, Greg just thought he couldn't keep time well enough. What? Greg's been playing with Chuck for years. And now he says he has trouble keeping time with it. That he's been annoying him for, for a long time. He was fired supposedly because Ginn was working on more rhythmic, rhythmically complex stuff, which required really tight rhythm and tempo. Why not just get a second rhythm guitarist, you know, to replace Dez? Why, why out, why push out Chuck? Cause here's the alternate history, super quick alternate history. This is just off the top of my head. Ready? Alternate history. They were, instead of firing Chuck, they replace Dez with another rhythm guitar player. Black Flag never breaks up. They SST signs Nirvana instead of Sub Pop. And it's Black Flag that ushers in grunge instead of like Seattle. Wouldn't that be crazy? They sign the Melvins. You could imagine all of those bands going to SST under the under uh, the uh, sort of with, with Black Flag being the flagship of that, that out of hardcore punk comes Black Flag sort of pushing in into grunge. I now I said before, this is off the top of my head. It's not. I, I read that in a YouTube comment under one of my not that particular thing, but just the idea of what would have happened if uh black flag had not broken up that maybe they would have been more involved with grunge gin has said in interviews that he never really was into grunge he liked some of the earlier grunge bands like Soundgarden and, and such but who knows man who friggin knows um with duca uh all right here we go but that's why i got canned but that's also what attracted me to uh, most of the band this guy speeding down and slowing up based on the emotions he was feeling for the music at the moment that's the kind of player that Dukaska was, was an emotional player with my hippie background that really stood for something it was in the moment so so even from note to note with Dukowski even with four notes in a bar each note would be attacked with a different sensitivity a different physical attack so that one note might be a little muffled and one note might be a little louder, a little bit more of a bent note. And that was Dukowski. There was a lot of ego involved. I noticed that Ginn was pretty much a very insecure guy. And a lot of conflicts he had with almost everyone around him seemed to be stemming from a basic sense of insecurity and paranoia. The thing is, everyone in his family is really pure intellectual genius. His dad, his mom, his brothers, his sisters. The whole Ginn family is really unique and special, and special in their own ways, but they're all special. And there's something about genius that tends to breed a certain way of thinking that most of us regular folk just don't experience. That is so on the friggin' nose true, man. Um. Dukowski was really wrecked when he got fired from the band, especially considering that he was part of the inner, inner, inner circle of Black Flag. I don't think you could be in the inner, inner, inner circle of Black Flag. I mean, he's in Black Flag. He's in the circle. He's in the center of the circle, right? Um, but there was no inner, inner, inner circle. There was only Greg Ginn. And I'm telling you, as far as I'm concerned to this day, the heart and soul of Black Flag was Chuck Dukowski. The actual essence of everything was Chuck Dukowski. And now this is an interesting point. Who Henry wanted to please was Chuck Dukowski. That's not the interesting point. I'm about to say what it is. Who I wanted to please was Chuck Dukowski. He was it. And to this day, although I have no contact with him, I still have a sense of hero worship towards Chuck Dukowski. Hmm. Just talking to you about him, I could cry right now. There's that much emotion still attached, and I haven't seen him or hung out with him in almost 25 years. He's one of a kind, totally singular. I've never known anyone else like him, and I never will again. But again, even he, it turned out, was able to be snowed by Greg. And when he got it, it was like a stab in the back. Uh, I trusted the band so much that I just kind of went along with it all, remembers Friedman. 
of immediate aftermath of Chuck's exit. So that was Glenn Friedman talking, the photographer who, who photographed Misfits and Black Flag and every Circle Jerks and every punk band known to man. But already other things were beginning to happen. And so it was like, how could this ever be? I went and saw them play. And by that time, they were playing songs from Slip, Slip It In and My War. And were, uh, uh, sorry, they were playing songs from Slip It, Slip it In and My War was already almost done. And to me, My War was the beginning of the end. The second side of the album was intolerable, frankly. When you lose the soul of your band, Chuck Dukowski, it's bound to fall apart. It couldn't survive, even though Chuck was going to be managing the band and helping them set up tours and stuff. It was gone, man, gone. You could see it in their faces on stage. Not that they were still intense, weren't still intense and loving what they were doing. It was just different, man. They were now fighting the people that were once supporting them because the audience grew out of control. Not that they... Not that they controlled their audience because they never wanted to control the audience, but that their audience went in a different direction and it became difficult for them as artists to see that the audience was no longer really caring about them, uh, but was into what was going on around punk rock. It was bars on Henry's arm and they were coming to see, that they were coming to see, not so much the artist, the logo, not the creative energy. Maybe that was what they orig wanted originally but you have to be careful with what you wish for because you might get it. That's kind of what happened. Um, so that's when, that's when they go into total access and they record the second album, my war with, with Bill and Henry and okay. So that's, so let's now quickly touch on this. We're, we're just, we're just sort of going, we're, 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 we're feeling it out here. Okay. Here, I'm going to put my, my signature shades back on. Yes, Chad, he did. Henry did sort of, we're going to talk about that. I have the legal papers. We're going to get there. We are going to get there. Buckle in, folks. Buckle in, because we're going to get there. Now, here's the other thing. We've talked about what makes a band a band. What gives a band it's legitimacy in order to be a band. And we've talked, there's so many different versions of bands that are legitimate and bands that are not legitimate. For instance, the Ramones, heart and soul of the Ramones, was, you know, Joey and Johnny, that nucleus of Joey and Johnny was enough to keep the Ramones intact, especially with, with them getting songs from Dee Dee still, despite him not being in the band. They were they were still the Ramones. They still felt like the Ramones, right? Um, even Black uh, Black Sabbath, you know, Ozzy and Bill Ward bounce, and they get uh, what's his name? Uh, they get Vinny on drums, Vinny a piece, a, a priest, whatever the hell his name is, and uh, or is it Carmine? Maybe it's Carmine. His brother. It's Carmine, not Vinny. Carmine and uh, Ryan James Dio. And they are, they're, they're different, but it's still, that's Black Sabbath. People accept that as Black Sabbath. Um, you, you, they're, like there are some ways because Tommy Iommi and Geezer Butler, they are the heart and the soul of the band. What is the heart and the soul of a band or what is, is it that gives it a band its thing? I think you need to have, you need to have at least two or two or three or four of these qualities. You need to have a founding member or multiple founding members. You need to have the principal songwriter, singer songwriter. You need to have the frontman singer or the frontman singer songwriter. You need to have one or all of these elements in order for a band to still feel like a band. Look at a band like what is an example of a band that just has the original frontman guy and that has a rotating lineup, you know? Oh, here's a great example. No matter leaving, even though you would, you could argue that, you know, there are other members of fear that make fear, fear leaving is fear. Whoever leaving has backing him up. It's still going to be fear. Like we're all, everybody would probably agree. Oh, spit sticks. Isn't there. That's okay. It's still fear. 
he is the the nucleus, the the heart, the soul. He's the front man. He's the lead singer. I don't know if he was the songwriter or not, but you could swap out any guy. Um, uh, Joey, you know, Joey, you know, you know what head from DOA. He's the only constant member, but no matter who he's with, whether Chuck Biscuits are, is there or not, or his brother Dimwit is there or not, or Randy Rampage is there or not, it's still going to feel like DOA. Lemmy from Motorhead, as long as you have Lenny, Lemmy from Motorhead, it's going to be Motorhead. You know what I mean? So it's like, it's like you need to have there there is this like there there is this element the red hot chili peppers flea and anthony kiedis both founding members both songwriters and anthony kiedis is the frontman vocalist unchanged metallica look at metallica um you have the you have two founding members you have the the lead singer vocalist and songwriter Who's still there, even though you would say that Kirk Hammett is essentially an original member, even though he's not, because you had Dave Mustaine was there before him. I think there was another guitarist even before him, right? I will agree with this, yes. And then you have bands that that I, I agree, man. X X is four people, right? X is four people: Billy Zoom, DJ Bone Bone Break, John Doe, and Xene. Without those four, you don't have X. They do make up a collective heart and soul of that band um but so the, it's like a weird sort of thing look at the misfits you have one founding member bringing back his original guitar player brother but the singer songwriter frontman is not there it's not the misfits without glenn danzig right so it's like it's interesting how yeah megadeth look at megadeth dave dave mustaine well, wasn't uh, the, the the other guy, the bass player, he was there for a long time, but nobody thinks of, of Megadeth and they think of the other guy. They look at Dave Mustaine. In the case of Black Flag, the it was never, the, the nucleus was not around the singer, just like with Black Sabbath. So you didn't need Keith Morris for it to feel like Black Flag. All you you, you really needed was Greg Ginn and his instrumentality. However, even though he wasn't the the main singer songwriter, the heart of the band was Dukowski. And when Dukowski left, a lot of people unanimously felt as we were just reading this book, they had lost is that to take away from uh Bill and Kira their their version of Black Flag that that lineup of Black Flag, the uh the slip it in lineup of, of black flag. No, I mean, that is, that's absolutely a valid form of black flag. But that point, it's almost like that heart and soul, I guess maybe gets transferred from Dukowski into Henry Rollins in a way. And then Henry Rollins is the, is the, is carrying Dukowski's torch. Remember he says, do you want me to leave with you, Chuck? And he says, no, stay with black flag. He's carrying the torch. He's carrying the torch and, and doing, um, you know, doing the black flag thing. So, <clears throat> but my point is, is that all the people in the comments and people saying Gin is black flag, he's not, it's not just Gin, it's Dukowski. Dukowski is black flag too. Gin is the mastermind, but Dukowski is the heart. And as you just heard from all those people in this book, that without Dukowski, a crucial element is missing. And that's why the band evolved and changed and wasn't the same black flag that everybody loved in the early eighties and eventually fizzled out in 86. Right. And, you know, they were moving towards sludge, like sludge metal and instrumental and all this stuff. They weren't doing that with Chuck and the band. When Chuck leaves, it's like Chuck was the Chuck is the, 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 the line that tethers Greg Ginn to the ground his limited rhythm playing is what, you know, almost prevents Greg Ginn from maybe flying off the rails in the way that he did. And so when Greg sort of, you know, killed this, this part of his band, he, he's now left unchecked in any shape or form. 
And the band goes in the direction that does, and eventually it fizzles out. It gets to a point where, you know, again, Greg, oh, Greg's ready to push out Kira. Greg pushes out Bill. Now Greg wants to push out Henry. Let's let's read that real quick before we move on. Moving on to the next part of our story here. <clears throat> to replace, uh, here we got to take off the glasses again. By the way, if this is your first time joining us, please do me a favor. This is super important, you guys. Please make sure to subscribe to the channel. Hit the subscribe button. Uh, like, like this uh, video and leave a comment, please. These things really help support the channel. Very important stuff, especially the subscribing. Um, so here's the next little part of our story. The 1986 tour would prove especially dispiriting for Henry. So my, let, all right, quick setup, quick, super quick setup. I really want to move on because we, we have a, a, a few more things to cover and they're, they're important, but this is the end of black flag. We're about to read. So the, there is, even when, when the Duke gets pushed out, when Chuck Dukowski gets pushed out, the lineup of black flag does restabilize and ends up touring and putting out so much material they put out four or five albums over two years something like that four albums eps you know the process of weeding out who's got the 10 and a half inch all, all this stuff starts coming out uh annihilate this week um family man loose nut slip it in my war am i missing something you guys i'm probably missing something in any case, that version of the band also annoys Gin. So he, as I said, he pushes out Kira. She she finds out, she finds out from Chuck. Chuck hits her up and goes, "Hey, you're. Uh, they don't want to play with you anymore. You're you're out of the band." And I just want to uh, quickly note, to make a quick note of Kira. Kira is an unsung hero of like like women in punk rock because she's in one of the, the toughest, like, you know, gnarliest bands out of LA. And she is just, she's holding her own. What, what she endured the, the was so rough and tough. And she, no matter how much she wanted to quit, she never, ever, ever gave in to whatever, you know, feeling of maybe I, 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 this is too much for me. I want to walk away. She never did. She never did. She stuck that course all the way until they said, we don't want you anymore, but that she, I just to quickly note that she was really something else, just tough as nails uh, and just really, really something else. Um, G Greg would rehearse this band and just, just grind them into dirt with rehearsal, getting them to play these notes so heavy, they would just practice for hours and hours and work it. And this is when Bill, and if you watch Bill play, Bill is a fan. Bill is one of my favorite drummers to watch. He is absolutely one of my favorite. He, uh, she did, she was in college the whole time that she was in Black Flag, Kara was, and she would come and go, but she never, she was, she was kicked out. She did not leave because of college. It made sense for her because she was ultimately, uh, she was ultimately in college, but she, she, she was, she was pushed out, but Bill is one of the, uh, go watch a video of Bill playing drums. He is, I, I got, I saw flag live in 2013 at Irving Plaza with TSOL, uh, opening one of the best bill double bills I've ever seen, man, just I, and I'm sitting there and I'm watching Flag and I'm enjoying myself. But the person I'm really just gravitated towards is Bill Stevenson watching the power. He doesn't move his arms when he hits. Look at the way that he hits. And again, I'm not a drummer. I don't know how to play the drums. But if you notice that when he's hitting the drums, he is not really moving his arms very much. All of the power is in his wrists. He, it's like he conserves energy by 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 you know it, you know wiring all that hit power to his wrists instead of you know flailing his arms around. He doesn't need to do it. He's not a flashy player. You might be tempted to call Bill Stevenson 
a meat and potatoes drummer, but he's not either because some of those, whatever you call them, uh, beats, timings, uh, rhythms that he's doing, especially the stuff in all, it's like, I mean, it's crazy. It's all over the place. He is, he is just, he is something else. Yes. Riot stick. Uh, uh, Josh, you're right. Marky, Marky as well. If you, this, I, this, I, anybody who's ever seen Marky player, uh, yeah, really Marky, not, not as much as, uh, I don't think there's much video of Tommy doing this, but the, it's all, it's all in that wrist, the, that sort of thing. Um, he is, yes, Joe, I love the way you're saying this. Uh, Stevenson is a master of economy in the way he plays and sets up his kit. It's something else, man. It's just something else. And you sit there and you watch this guy and you're just kind of like, you know, one might not even take, do a double take at a guy like Bill. Cause he's just, he's a very, he seems like a very humble dude. He's just a, uh, he doesn't care about looking fancy or flashy. And then when he gets in there, he is just, he is the, he's such a, what a backbone that. All of that, a lot of that power, I think, after reading this book, that comes from his Black Flag years. Being in that rehearsal space with Kira and uh, Greg and Henry and just just hitting those drums so hard and having to learn how to you know, do that in an economical way that makes sense for the situation. So in any case, he gets pushed out. Kira gets pushed out. Uh, they bring in two. They bring in this guy Anthony, and I don't know his name's Cell, C E L C apostrophe E L. That's the final lineup of Black Flag. And um, I don't know. Let's let's just read a little bit further. This is the this is the de- like this is when when things die. Hold on. Uh, turn to page. 356 in your books if you if you have the spray paint the walls book um the 1986 tour would prove especially dispiriting for henry not least as his relationship with gin began to swiftly deteriorate before the tour the the pair had briefly discussed plans for another black flag album according to gin Henry said, why can't we do another album like in, oh, that's the one I'm always thinking of. Family Man, In My Head, Loose Nut, Slip It In, and My War. And In My Head, Family Man, Loose Nut, and Slip It In, same lineup. That's Kira, Bill, Gin, and Henry. So in like a year and a half, two years, they put out four albums worth of material stuff that the slip it in stuff had been, you know, as, as Friedman was saying, they'd been playing that as early as 83, you know? Um, so there's that. <clears throat> so, so Henry wants, when they're talking about doing another album, uh, Ginn and Henry, cause they're the nucleus of the band. Now they're the, they're the brains of the band, you know, uh, let's do another album, like in my head. So people won't always trying to be uh, trying to be cat. Uh, blah, blah, blah. So people won't always be trying to catch up with what we're doing. And he never said that before. He had always trusted me. This is Gin talking, by the way. And he had never said that before. He had always trusted me to go in directions music wise that he might not understand at first. But then in the long run, they made sense with him. But he understood that that was against the grain commercially. Because that's what ultimately Black Flag turned into after Dukowski leaves, or even maybe before Dukowski leaves. They they start they're moving away. As we said, we've used these words. They're words that are often used to describe Black Flag. I'm not inventing this. This is not new. Sludgy, medley, instrumental. You know, free form. Gin was big on the Grateful Dead. You can you feel that in the DNA of that later Black Flag stuff. A lot of it is alienating all the people that were in the hardcore punk scene and loved black flag. They just did not get what they were doing. Nothing, none of it was commercial. All of it was about just chasing the sound. That's what Gin was doing. He was chasing the sound. He was not, you know, uh, he, he was not, whatchamacallit. He was not playing to the crowd. 
for Greg, this comment, the, the thing about, about let's do another album, like in my head for Greg, this comment was enough to guarantee Henry's excommunication from the group's inner circle to receive the same treatment that had been doled out to Chuck, to Kira, and to countless other members before. It was, after all, Greg's band. And if Henry wasn't willing to give himself wholly to Greg's creative whims without question, then he could leave the band. Only Henry wasn't just a member of Black Flag anymore. With his extracurricular activity, his spoken word performances, his early publications and work with uh, writing for magazines like Spin and The Village Voice, his media profile. That's what we're really talking about. What we're talking about, uh, Henry just like transcending the punk world altogether. His media profile was just so much bigger than Greg's. And all of Black Flag or equal to Black Flag, Henry said, after a while, and it was Chuck who turned him on to the spoken word stuff. After a while, Henry was starting to, he was starting to do tours. When like Black Flag would get off tour, he'd go on a spoken word tour. He'd hop in a truck with a uh, Black Flag roadie. I don't think it was Mugger. It was somebody else. And they would just go and tour. And they, they, they just went, they just went, uh, they'd go around. They'd be doing their thing. And he said that he was drawing at first, he was drawing anywhere from 12 to 50 people a night, but eventually he was, he was doing black flag numbers in certain places. So people were, you know, flocking to see Henry do a thing that didn't require backing band of musicians. Incredible to think. And so now Henry is essentially, he, he, he's outgrowing black flag in that kind of way uh right just want to thank riots uh josh from riot stickers for the um uh, uh for the support and he says it would be bad if everybody follow it wouldn't be bad if everybody follows my lead that's the quote is that a gin quote um yes wicked ramon i've heard gin being described as restlessly creative we can definitely see that Listen, since we're here now and we have a, a large crowd, let's actually take our, our little sponsorship break. Um, you know, sometimes sometimes things can get a little sticky. And you know what you need when things get a little sticky? Stickers. That's right, folks. Do you know what powers this channel? It's riotstickers.com. Riotstickers.com is a independently owned business. Uh, I've done business with them in the past. I was very satisfied. Um some friends and friends of mine have also done business with riotstickers.com. Great place to go for your, your sticker needs. We're doing a special promotion. You can see it right here. Nice deal for your band. $29 and 50 cents. That's 50% off for 53 inch by three inch stickers at riotstickers.com with a promo code from us. F R U M is in Mary E S S from us. If you go out down into the description of this video, Click on the link and that'll take you to ridestickers.com. Do you have a band? Do you have an artistic project? Do you need an image to be put on a sticker so that you can stick it somewhere? You want to stick it to the man? You want to stick it on a cop car? Don't stick it on a cop car. All right, maybe stick it on a cop. No, don't. I, that was a joke. Uh, if you want to just, if you want to uh, uh, st stick it somewhere uh, and promote your business, go to ridestickers.com. Uh, you're not going to find a better deal. Normally, this deal is $59, but this promotion is only available on this channel. $29.50, okay? You're not going to find a better deal. Uh, and with that, we got to go to the 60-second video. Ridestickers.com. Ridestickers. We are the...
All right. <laughs> so check it out. Um, fuck, I lost my place. Where was I? And I just cussed. Didn't mean to cuss. It happens. If you want to hang with us, don't cuss. All right. Um, ba -ba 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 -ba. So, so, all right. So we were talking about Henry. Henry is at a place that Henry is impeachable. Okay. Thank you, Chad. I see your name there. Much appreciated. Oh, I see what you mean. Follow my lead. That's right. You know, the support that 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 Josh has lent, I don't normally ever ask for uh, stickers or donations or anything. They're much appreciated. Tips and things are much appreciated when they come. Yes, you should follow his lead for sure. That's what that's what keeps uh, keeps us going. Much appreciated, Chad. I really appreciate the support. The man isn't who we think it is anymore. Awesome. Thank you. Oh, my God. And <laughs> thank you, man. Stick it to the mailman. Thank you, Runner. Much appreciated, guys. I really do. I, I appreciate the uh, the support. Sahara Sahara's going to stick them on a cop car. <laughs> um, so I saw Henry do a spoken word gig about six weeks after seeing Black Flag. Interesting. What's up, Droid? All right, all right. Let's let's dive back in, guys. Let, let's focus. We got to focus here. We got to focus here. Or the female man. Let's include everyone. That's right. We want to include everyone. Thank you. Thank you guys for the support, though. I appreciate it. Truly. Truly. Okay. Back to the reading. So, so Greg could not easily sack Henry from Black Flag. <laughs> Henry wasn't just a member of Black Flag anymore with his extracurricular activity, his spoken word performances, his early publications, and work writing for magazines like Spin and the Village Voice made his media pro profile dwarf Greg's and maybe that a black flag. Greg could not could not uh easily sack Greg could not easily could no ah sorry I just can't read. Greg could no easier sack Henry from Black Flag than sack himself. It didn't help that Greg's parents liked Henry. Uh Henry used to live in a shack on Greg's parents' property in the backyard. You know what I mean? Um, <laughs> uh, it made, it made having him, it made his having always, I can't read. I can't read. Uh, it didn't help that Greg's parents liked Henry adds Joe. It made his having always had second thoughts. Oh, that's a weird sentence. That's why I can't read it. It made his having always had second thoughts about Henry a bigger problem than it would have been. So Greg, it was harder for Greg to, to have second thoughts because of that situation. Um, Chuck was the uh, Chuck was the one who Chuck was the one who was really into Henry and Henry was the obvious choice and he was going to work and he was never going to quit. Whatever Greg did to get Chuck out of the band, he didn't do that with Henry. And the fact that he didn't do it, maybe it made him mad with himself. It's hard to fathom it all because none of it was ever spoken out loud. So everything else, so this is all conjecture. Okay. This is all conjecture here. Like it's just we we don't we don't know. Um, unable to sack Henry, Ginn instead to cho uh, instead chose to air his feelings right at the start of the tour. So, so after they have this conversation about you know let's make another album like in my head, and Ginn's like, okay, Henry's got to become persona non grata, but I can't fire Henry. It's like impossible to fire him because, you know, he is basically he's his, his claws are so deep into black flag that we just can't, you know, we're, we're, we're part of this, this team together. We're, we're part of this thing. Um, Unable to sack Henry, Ginn instead chose to air his feelings right at the start of the tour. Greg does not like me much, Rollins writes after a show in Florida at the end of January. At least he told me I can respect that. It makes playing kind of strange sometimes though 
But while Henry initially tried to shrug off Greg's rebuke, a few nights later, he molded over some more in his journal. More and more, I start to question, why am I doing what I'm doing? He wrote, Greg doesn't like me at all and thinks I have ill feelings towards him. There's no convincing him otherwise. I respect Greg more than anyone I know. He's incredible. I think Black Flag is his second string project, Gone being his first. I think that the other members of Gone know that. You can see it uh, when they deal with the rest of Black Flag. It does not bother me. They are great musicians. I do think they give Greg a run for his money. The flag would wound their way slowly across America in, a, in three six-week loops. Tension, because that's what they would do. They went, they went three six-week loops across America. Tensions building without release until the vans pulled into Detroit at the same place that the Misfits played their final show at Greystone Hall. Um, for the final night of the tour, they ran through roughly the same set list. They'd played at every show that year drawn mostly from their last three albums, save for the last burst through gimme, gimme, gimme just before the encore, a bootleg of the show finds them playing mostly on autopilot, a sleek polish. I'm not going to read all this because it's just blah, 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 blah. this latest incarnation of the flag lacked the mordant trudge of, say, the Kira and Bill Stevenson version of the group. And it was up to Rollins to scare up most of the intensity on his own. Um, here is here is where so here's where it ends, right? Yes, Kaiser, you're right. It is ironic that eventually Gone would make up Henry Rollins' first band. While the manner in which Greg Ginn called, uh, while the manner in which Greg Ginn called an end to Black Flag threw Henry Rollins off guard, there weren't many who were surprised that the group had decided to part ways. Black Flag had made no secret of the dire cost of the path they had chosen for the group of how they, how ultimately enervating and discouraging their adversarial relationship with their audience and with authorities could be those closer to the group meanwhile had sensed a change of atmosphere with the group and within the wider sst community had begun to notice greg's growing distaste for his front man and how much more the guitarist seemed to enjoy playing with his other band gone than the group he had now led for over eight years I felt like it wasn't going to be the same anymore, reflected, reflected Gin to Punk Planet Zine in 1997 of his decision to split the group. I really liked what we had done, but where we were go what where but what was going to be the next step? I felt like I was up against too much. I felt like we couldn't go out on a limb because there was too much to lose. Referring to Henry's desire to make another album in the mold of in my head, he added, I saw that I couldn't fight everybody. I and I wanted to leave when I could be proud of everything. I mean, this is such bull. This is such crap. I, I, I don't buy this for a second. I feel lucky that I never had to pick up a guitar or a bass and play something I didn't want to play. I never wanted to be a musician. I just wanted to play music, my own music. Greg Ginn had a lot of turmoil with people, says Mugger today. Like that Mugger was like, he, he, was, a, he was a black flag roadie that, just he was there for everything he was there for the whole creepy crawl and tough as nails he had his own band to uh sort of like a side project of black flag and he was um apparently a rather <laughs> capable of, of of rather nasty things that i will not uh repeat on this camera but just let's just say he, he didn't respect his tour mates um personal space <laughs> um like the CEO of a big corporation, he expected a lot out of people. That that's Mugger speaking of Gin. And I don't think he was getting what he wanted out of his musicians. He thought he could do more with a new band, with other people. So I wasn't surprised. I think that in his mind, he wanted a certain type of output for his music, and he wasn't able to get it from Black Flag. These people aren't under any contract. It's not like David Beckham playing for LA Galaxy, where you can just yell at him or whatever. It was a loosely assembly, it was a loose assembly of people. What's he going to do how much can you motivate a person how much can you piss off a person in his mind he couldn't do a lot you know so he had to disassemble it there was also a sense that black flag wasn't greg ginn's band anymore certainly not in the way that it had been in the pre-damaged years or even back when he and chuck had first welcomed henry abroad 
He had been able to flex his authority over the group in recent years, dispatching Chuck, then Bill, then Kira, when he felt another direction was necessary. By the time Greg's tolerance for Henry reached its end, however, Henry's own identity was so entwined with that of Black Flag that he could not be so easily dispatched. The balance of power within the group had shifted, and the charismatic vocalist, whose duties had speedily expanded to include songwriting, because he started, you know, I, I forget which one it is. I don't know. I think it's Family Man. Family Man is a weird LP. It's one side is all instrumentals, and one side is spoken word, Henry doing spoken word. So Henry doesn't play on the, obviously, because it's instrumentals. Henry's not playing on the instrumental side, and Black Flag's not playing on the Henry side. In fact, you could almost consider it to be a split record. It's a Henry Rollins solo record and a Black Flag uh, record. It's a Henry Rollins Black Flag split in that kind of weird way. Um, so whose duties had speedily included songwriting and who had laterally cultivated an identity for himself outside of Black Flag, which is the smartest thing Henry Rollins ever did with his writing and his spoken word performances, seemed by 1986 to have at least as much a say in the group's direction as the flag's founder of guitars. And that's no good for again. And this is why Black Flag died, honestly, because, because Henry became too big for Ginn to control and Ginn was the be all say all. And if he couldn't be the be all say all, then he was going to destroy the band. And that's, that's the bottom line. It's that simple. Maybe he got a little bit carried away towards the end. Ginn said as diplomatically as he could ma manage of Rollins tenure with Black Flag who interviewed by Eric Blair in 2003. That's a great interview. That's on YouTube. In a way, we were blessed in the first three singers were really good, but they didn't have the rock star on the lead singer thing. In that sense, Black Flag was a band of the people, you know, because we were just regular people. It was the first band I played in. I didn't consider myself this or that. And we had singers that didn't consider themselves anything special. They just played music that we liked. Whereas with Henry, he evolved into more of the lead singer role, the prototype of David Lee Roth or whatever jumping around. Ginn denied that he felt sour grapes over Henry becoming the focus of the band, but in the same breath, tried to downplay Henry's contribution to Black Flag. You always hear people in bands resenting the singer gaining attention, but that just comes with the territory, you know? If you want the attention, then you should sing. It's just natural that people think of the singer as maybe representing a group. Of course, a lot of people who play music that know that there's that 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 uh, that it's kind of ridiculous. Uh, usually, it's the band practicing, working on songs, and then the singer comes in and practices once a week or something like that. The reality of it is, a lot of the times, the singer has a lot less to do with the group than the other members. Certainly, having taken the decision to split Black Flag, although the exact wording Rollins, we have to read all this because we're about to look at the lawsuit and this is the perfect foundation for referencing that lawsuit. Um, this is super important. Ginn was swift to draw a line in their relationship and cut off as many ties as he could. When the band split up, Greg told me, I want you out of my parents' house. Rollins told Stephen Blush, some Stephen Blush, who I interviewed for the, the, the Lodi thing. I said, I wouldn't think of staying there. Greg was always... Greg will always think I have had it in for him and don't like him, but I have nothing but respect for him. I don't care what he says about me. The fact that I keep in touch with his parents really bums him out. Um, all right. The, the rest of this is just aftermath here. And then what I want to discuss, but maybe we should just skip ahead because there's the first reunion that happens in 2003, and this is really surreal. This is a surreal situation. Let's see how long it is. I think it's a couple, it's a couple pages. Oh man, but it's so good. It's the end of the book. It's the end of the book. I don't know. All right, let's read a little bit of it because we'll we'll go in chronological order. We're getting there. We're getting there, folks. Here's the final part. So the band breaks up. Rollins does the Rollins band. As a matter of fact, a bunch of the Black Flag guys get together because Rollins is doing some activism for the West Memphis Three. They put out that West Memphis West Memphis Three Black Flag uh, tribute album. This whole time, mind you, and we're, we'll touch on this in a second. 
Dukowski stays with SST until 1989. That's when he leaves. At some point, I don't know if it's 89. Oh, you know what? Maybe it was actually later. Maybe. No, I think Dukowski left in 89. What happens is Dukowski sells his, his stake in SST. As I said, he was part owner of SST. Uh, Ginn bought out his interests in SST, but Ginn had him stay. Dukowski kept working at SST uh, in, uh, I think, distribution or something in the distribution arm of SST. He was integral to all kinds of operations after no longer being a partial owner of the label. Know what I'm saying? So, um, so he's around, he leaves. Here's what he, here's when he claims to leave. And we'll look at the interview when he says this, he finds out that none of the bands have been getting allegedly, uh, this is what was said in the interview public record that none of the bands were getting paid or lots of bands were not being paid royalties. And when he found out that the bands were getting screwed, he left. That's when he finally, that he, he left the day that he found that out. Uh, eventually he'd have another lawsuit in 2007 over royalties. I tried to dig up as much as I could on that. I couldn't find much. And that ended with a settlement. And that brought us into the last decade or so. Um, but in 2003, Ginn actually reunites. And Ginn had done a bunch of bands. He did Gone, he did the Royal We, the Texas something or other, the Texas Toasts or something. Uh, SST. Uh, uh, relocates or locates itself in Texas. Matter of fact, Kurt Cobain, going back to Cobain for a second, it's Kurt, Kurt Cobain calls the SST store in order to get the number of Pat Smear. And that's how Pat Smear gets into Nirvana through SST. Um, but they relocate to, to Austin, Texas. And that's where again, is based out of Texas. I think it's Austin, Texas, somewhere in Texas. In 2003, Ginn attempts to do a reunion. We're going to read about that right now. Uh, while Morris, so we were just talking about, there was this thing for West Memphis Three that featured Keith Morris and Henry Rollins, who at this point in time have a good relationship. All of the members of Black Flag, apart from Ginn, seem to have love or some sort of shared bond of fraternity all the way up until maybe the last you know, 10, 12, 13 years ago. That's when things really start to uh, fracture a little bit. They fracture a bit in various ways. Um, but up until that, up until that point, everybody's kind of like, you know, uh, amic amicably, you know, uh, friends or friendly on friend on good terms with each other. And Keith Morris and Henry Rollins, they team up for that West Memphis three benefit CD and they're touring around, raising awareness and yada, yada. Meanwhile, meanwhile, you have, da, 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 you have here. So while Morris was working on his contribution to the West Memphis three album, uh, he was also rehearsing for another separate black flag reunion led by Greg Ginn. I was with the Circle Jerks on the last show of a tour, remembers Morris. We were playing over by the L.A. Coliseum at the Cypress Hill Organized Festival called The Smokeout. We were one of the first bands to arrive because that's the kind of guys we are. I was cornered by Paul Tollett and Rick Van Santen, who were the two main guys at Golden Voice, which is a promotional company. If you're out in L.A., you know who Golden Voice is, right? Uh, Golden Voice would eventually lead to the to, to another reunion of flag members you can't i wouldn't you wouldn't call it black flag but you call it flag members which is going to bring us back to our conversation about what makes a band a band this is very important to that conversation um <clears throat> and so he gets cornered by the guys at golden voice and they say keith keith we have a proposition for you we're going to put a couple of the black we're going to put on a couple of black flag shows at the Hollywood Palladium, and we need for you to be a part of it, a major part of it. Paul pulled up his pant leg and showed me all these flea bites that he had on his leg. Flea bites. Yes, flea bites. They said Greg 
was housing stray cats that he was finding down on the streets in Long Beach and was working with a cat rescue mission. I had no problem with that. This is this is uh, Keith Morris talking. I like cats. I'm not afraid of fleas. But I was told, beware. There's quite a few cats in the space where you're going. I thought, okay, nothing like a little extra, nothing that a little extra garlic won't solve. You can ward off fleas just like you can ward off vampires. I did not know that, but that makes sense because vampire uh, fleas suck blood just like vampires do. So I guess it it, it makes sense. Uh, they said we need you to be the coordinator, the coordinator, coordinator. I had no problem with that because I wanted to do it with all of these bands reforming all of the new interest in the bands that had enjoyed a minimal amount of success. Originally, I only rehearsed twice and it was ugly. So when he's saying this right here, this is important. He says I, I was, he was happy to be the coordinator and to get involved because, and here's the thing. Why are they talking about cats? Why are they talking about cat mission rescue? That's going to come into the story as well. This is one of the most, you know, crazy attempts at a reunion, failed reunion, botched reunion, I guess you would call it. Um, and and also is a testament to Greg Ginn's ego. You know what I mean? I only rehearsed twice and it was ugly. It was brutal. Wait, wait, wait. Let's go back for a second. Why is he saying this is important? Why is he talking about? bands that had a minimal amount of success originally and all the new interest because around the 2000s in the early 2000s that's when a lot of punk bands started to try and reform and reunite you had the new york dolls you had iggy and the stooges these these widely received incredibly successful reunions resurgences uh where these bands that did not have a lot of success initially are starting to make big bucks going out there and touring under the names same thing happened with uh the pistols right like you know even the ramones after they had broken up you know not long after they broken up they were offered a million dollar guarantee down in south america you know in the 90s do you know what that guarantee would probably be today could you imagine somebody being like well, if the, all the ramones were still kicking five million dollars ramones come down here you know something like that I'd imagine inflation and whatnot. It's crazy. Anyway. So they had two rehearsals and they were ugly. It was brutal. It was stupid. It was a waste of time. It was, and it was also an amazing learning experience, but I was so completely excited. It was black flag. It was, I was shaking in my shoes, quivering with anticipation. Like dude, Greg Ginn, Robo, Chuck, the Duke, the four of us, out on stage this is what keith morris is thinking we're gonna do some serious damage we're gonna we're gonna you know drive people insane we're gonna come out we're gonna do all the we're gonna we're gonna take all these new boy band major label corporate get on a bus and stay in a hotel xbox playing red box <laughs> red bull drinking kids and we're gonna tear them a new one we could just go out there with half the enthusiasm and still lay waste to the majority of these bands. That's very egotistical of me. And right now, I don't know if I could walk through a door. My head is so big. I had heard that Golden Voice wanted us to get back together. They were going to offer us $10 million and we were going to do a world tour, take a break, and then go out and do half the world again. I guess that's what they were planning on with, with the big festivals over in Europe, us being on Lollapalooza, even a warp tour. We had two nights booked at the Hollywood Palladium, 8,000 people. I went down there to rehearse. The first night was completely ridiculous. It was something out of spinal tap. So this is, this is now, this is what, this is Greg Ginn. This is like, this is unfiltered Greg Ginn. So for everybody who's saying, you know, Greg Ginn is Black Flag, this isn't Black Flag, and this is Greg Ginn. That's the point. No matter how much it might be Greg Ginn, it's, you know, it doesn't mean that it is necessarily black flag in that kind of way. Um, <clears throat> it was like spinal tap. I'm, st I'm standing there being friendly with Greg, trying to rekindle a friendship, a long lost friendship and making friends with the drummer in the background is a karaoke black flag CD playing but the tempos are just like elderly, like a band in retirement. So it was like, Greg, 
what's the deal with these tempos? Why are they so slow? There's no energy here. There's no spark, no passion. And Greg's response was, Keith, when we recorded those songs, we were playing them too fast. <laughs> and I'm like, ouch. Okay, what have I gotten myself into? So now Greg, uh, uh, an older man now, Greg has decided that the songs were played and recorded too fast and has made a black flag instrumental karaoke CD for them to sort of play along to or to, you know, sort of rehearse to. And Keith is like, oh, my God, what is this nonsense? Morris's involvement with the reunion soon ceased and his relationship with Greg devolved amid arguments over paying Keith's expenses for driving over to Long Beach for the rehearsals, accusations that Keith was spreading rumors about the rehearsals and disagreements about the form the concert should take. All the while, Morris kept tracking other members down to perform at what he imagined would be a historic celebration of the first four years of the group i even talked with henry says keith he said you know what i owe my career to greg ginn henry worships everything greg has ever done he has made a temple out of all that and that's totally effing cool because i love henry but henry said i can't go back down that path so even henry who's at like the height of his henry rollins powers in at this time i think in the early 2000s, he has a show on IFC, the Henry Rollins show. I mean, Henry is just, he's huge. In a few years, he's going to do Sons of Anarchy. I mean, he's just, he's everywhere, dude. He had done all those movies in the 90s. Keith was ultimately informed by Golden Voice that his services were not required for the Palladium show. I'm one of the founding members, you know. He says, I was out there. I got beat up a few times. I got hit with a few bottles and cans and I got in the van for little to no money. And I did it out of love because it's what I wanted to do with the reunion. I came to the realization that it was really good that I left when I left because all the accusations that followed my leaving, all of the finger pointing still continued. There was still all of the negativity. There was a reason for the flag being black. Isn't that apropos and this is what's so crazy about this uh, think about that line there's a reason for the flag being black isn't that crazy that they use the word flag for that that's really foreshadowing the tragedy is this book comes out in 2013 maybe and there is so much more that when did this book come out 2009 actually sorry 2000 this book came out in 2009 and as a result we end up it ends up missing all of the, the what would have been the final chapter of this book the final chapter of this book would have been everything with the lawsuits and all that stuff and instead this is the final chapter with flag flag would have been the final chapter keith focused his efforts on and i would say that flag is ultimately almost born out of this 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 botched attempt at a reunion like flag is comes you know 10 years later and is you know trying to set the wrong things right literally 10 years from now they'll be play, playing shows as flag um Keith focused his efforts on rehearsing with Rollins band for the American tour of the rise above album. Keith and Henry shared vocal duties during Epic sets that spanned the flag discography. Ginn had also donated his songs to the rise above album, but later said it's studio musicians playing black flag songs. So basically it has no balls adding that it, if he had organized a black flag tribute album, I would get all the people who could play black flag songs, right? Uh, I think this is going back. So that's it. I think that's in September. Here we go. Ready? Here it is. So that was the first attempt at the reunion, right? And it just, and it just, they, it's just so crazy. Um, In September, 2003, Greg Ginn's Black Flag played two consecutive shows at the Hollywood Palladium following a secret warm-up show in Long Beach. Two nights before it went down, Rick Golden Voice called me and said, Keith, saying, I'll put you on the guest list. 
you can show up and if you want you can get up on stage and sing a seuss a few songs for free hmm. i misread that you can get up on stage and sing a few songs feel free so the promoter, after all of that hullabaloo, the promoter is now saying, yeah, I'll put you on the guest list. Come on, sing a couple of songs for free. Meaning that they're, you know, uh, essentially trying to get him to perform for free. I said, I hope you have a great time. And I hope everybody that shows up there has an amazing time. I won't be there. And from what I heard, the only guy who had anything to good, uh, anything good to say about it was Rick Rubin. He said that Greg's guitar playing is, was amazing, which is funny because uh, Rick Rubin just did a podcast with Henry Rollins. And they were talking about Greg Ginn. It's just interesting that, that this didn't come up, but it's amazing that, you know, Keith could not convince Henry to get involved with Ginn despite, you know, uh, Henry's continued reverence for him. You know what I mean? It's just interesting to me. Very, very interesting. He's like, and that's the thing again, Gin is a narcissist, dude. He's like, he's pure friggin' narcissist. That's what it is, man. Um, it just a, a self-absorbed egomaniac. And here's the thing. I learned in my life that there's only one way to deal with these kind of people. You know the best way to deal with these people, especially if you've dealt with them already? Don't. If you have a narcissist in your life, if you have someone that is overly controlling or, you know, someone who is like, like happy to talk about you to other people behind your back and like spread ugly, like untrue things about you in order to make them look better, like all that sort of stuff and all, or the, the best as what happened in the story of black flag over and over where, where people are talking about you behind your back and then they turn them against you. Everybody starts to like slowly get very cold to you. If you're dealing with, with those people, by the way, Matt, the author is the author is um, Stevie Chick. Stevie Chick, uh, Stevie, like the name Stephen, Stephen, and then Chick, like a like a little chirpy bird. Chick, chick, chip, 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 chip. Stevie Chick. Um, you can see his name right there. Yeah, uh, Stanhope, you're absolutely right. Ignoring their existence is the best route, best way to deal with a narcissist, best way to deal with someone like that don't don't and you know what if they try to come back into your life or try to like gaslight you or make you think that something different just like it's bait it's a trap it's a trap just walk away you the best way to deal with these people just don't deal with them and the problem is you don't sometimes you don't know you're dealing with one until it's too late i'm so glad to hear that you purchased this book you're gonna it's a great read angus you're gonna really love it that's awesome man that's awesome. Um, so, oh, I didn't know that. He was from an email list. If, if I don't know if you know him, but tell him that I love his book and that we're reading it online here now. Very great writer, truly. In any case, just don't just don't deal with don't deal with narcissists. They they're, they're terrible. They're just terrible people. Um, the Palladium shows open with a set featuring Gin and Dez on guitars as skateboarder Mike Valley, who would later sing for uh, the, one of the most recent version of, of Black Flag as well, well as be a manager, yelled through the entirety of My War with pre-recorded bass lines played by an offstage tape recorder marking the stage debut of Dale Nixon. So th they used their bass player was their bass player was so so he went from booting Dukowski because he couldn't keep up with him, you know, rhyme wise to, you know, having a friggin tape machine. It's just so pathetic, man. Next up, Gin, Dez, uh, Gin and Dez were joined by Robo, who had lately been playing drums alongside Dez and the reformed Misfits and uh, bassist Cell, Rev, Rev, whatever, the, the last bassist guy. As Des roared through a clutch of songs from his era with the group, closing it out with Louie Louie. The group played two further sets. Robo left the stage, and Cell returned only after a bunch more songs with Dale Nixon playing. The group closed out the set with another run through of Louie Louie's. So they played Louie Louie twice. Oh my God. Just, ab ab just abysmal, man. And here's what people said. 
Although the players enthusiastically leaned into the songs, things didn't feel right without singers Keith Morris and Ron Reyes or co-founding bassist Chuck Dukowski. Not all the tunes had aged well, and the moment proved less electrifying than, the sh than it should have been. Five years later, Greg Ginn defended the show in the page of the uh, in pages of the LA Weekly, arguing that it was really good to play with people I hadn't played with in a long time. And I was able to encourage people to adopt cats. We raised about $95,000 for six organizations. That goes a long way. Questioned about the show's critics, Greg responded, I don't hang around cynical people. They never do, they'd never do something for a cat, so they can't understand that. There you go. It's unlikely that the criticisms of Black Flag's Palladium reu uh, reunion registered all that deeply with Greg Ginn. Um, in many ways, the show served as a reclamation of the group that he founded from the front man he felt had usurped the group and their songs and their history. That Palladium show disappointed so many, and even a cursory Google of the event turns up many more negative reviews on blogs and web pages throughout the internet. Um, so it, it doesn't matter because it's immaterial, according to the book, saying that the reunions presented Greg Ginn's idea of what Black Flag had been and were. Do you hear that, guys? All the people out there saying that Greg Ginn is Black Flag. Not taking that away from you, but I'm just saying this. The, I, the reunions presented, these reunions presented an idea, an ideal of what Black Flag had been and were as far as he was concerned. Uh, and this perspective was the only one that had counted. Um, that the ultimate lineup was also shaped by his inability to successfully renew relationships with the absent ex-members was similarly in spirit and ethos of Black Flag, <clears throat> a group that never knew an ideal situation in its lifespan that had fought valiantly with the best materials that they had. Perhaps the Palladium shows show uh, signified for Ginn an opportunity to finally bury Black Flag once and for all, Keith op op opining that Greg has basically closed the lid on the coffin and nailed it shut. If, Gid had, if Ginn had now finally turned his back on his history with Black Flag, he certainly hadn't abandoned music. All right, I'm not going to... We can stop here because... Yeah, I, I, we can't. That's the end anyway. That's the end of the book. So... So, so now we move into the modern age. That's what that's where things end at this point in time. Oh my goodness. That's where things end at this point in time. The the uh we get this abysmal reunion, and then something happens. And now I remember this a little bit differently. I for some reason I remember, I totally remember that Greg, that it was, that it was flag who did the first reunion and not Greg Ginn, but apparently Greg Ginn reformed black flag first. Here's what I think happened. I think that Keith Morris and Chuck Dukowski, they played a set of black flag songs with these guys. I forget their names. And then Ginn, reform black flag and then what happened was they were doing that anniversary golden voice show this was 2011 this was a big deal i remember when this happened everybody was 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 turning heads nobody could give a crap about what greg ginn was doing for all those people out there who were like ginn is black flag everybody was you know slack jawed at the notion that Chuck Dukowski wasn't going to do a speech at this Golden Voice anniversary. It was like the 30th anniversary and instead uh, jumped up at the end of uh, the Descendants set with Bill Stevenson and Stephen Stephen Egerton from, from the Descendants. Uh, and they did the entire Nervous Breakdown EP and people lost their minds. It, it was so well received. And you know, Steve uh, Stephen Egerton, he's Ste Stephen 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 Stephen. I think it's not it's not Stephen Stephen something like that. I don't know. He pronounces his name slightly weird. Right, no age. Thank you, thank you. It was no age. 
Thank you. No age. So th they had gone. He, he was he was schooled. He had learned how to play guitar. He had learned how to play guitar from Black Flag. So he was like a disciple of Black Flag. So with Stephen and and Bill and and those guys, they started and then they added Dez and they went out as Flag. Now, let's go back to a second to what we were talking about before. We talked about the Ramones were still valid. We were talking about how the Misfits were not valid. We talked about how the Chili Peppers are still the Chili Peppers, despite the lineup changes. Uh, Metallica is still Metallica. Black uh, Black Sabbath was still Black Sabbath. Like all these bands are still these bands because the core, the heart, heart and the soul remain. Here's an example where a band changes. And we've talked about this on the channel before. Joy Division. You have Ian, uh, what's his last name? Uh, Ian, um, I got to look this up. This is going to bother the crap in me. Joy Division leads Ian Curtis. Ian Curtis, the lead singer and songwriter of Joy Division. Yeah, he he passes away. We'll, we'll just call it like that, right? <clears throat> he passes away. And what does the rest of Joy Division do? They they continue on but they call themselves they call themselves new order right band member that is part of the heart and soul of who we are alters the name of our musical entity we can't use the name joy division without him without ian curtis it's impossible so we're going to call ourselves joy division and in doing so people have the 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 utmost respect for new order nobody is you know bewailing or bemoaning you know the fact that <clears throat> that joy division is out there uh, that they're imposters you know that kind of thing um the way that they do with the misfits this was ultimately and it brings us back to the misfits it brings us to sublime with rome for those of you who are sublime fans like myself i'm a big sublime fan um the, uh you know eric and bud did the unthinkable they they came back and you know i like that 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 kid's a good singer he's a good singer he's a good guitarist i hear he's kind of a he's a bit of a punk you know kind of like a uh kind of a jerk but um, they are a great, they were a great trio, uh, Rome, Eric and Bud, but they called themselves sublime and Bradley Noel was sublime. You can't call yourself. How could you call yourself sublime? If you're not, if you don't have the guy, the singer songwriter, front man, the, 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 the band leader, the guy, the main heart and soul of the band is dead. You have to change your name. They call themselves Sublime with Rome. Ha now, had they called themselves Secondhand Smoke, had they called themselves any other name, it would have been it would have been legitimate. It would have been so much more than it was. TSOL Ace Ace is talking about TSOL. By the way, Ace, I also I was talking about this earlier. I also saw Flag with TSOL. He said, having seen Flag. And Black Flag several times. I take Flag any day, all day, any day. Flag was fantastic. Keith, who was a grumpy old F, still brings it 100%. I 150 billion percent agree with Ace as well. That's what that's the what I was eventually coming to. I, I saw that Irving Plaza show, as I mentioned earlier in the show. Phenomenal. But here's my point. TSOL is another band. Every single member of TSOL left TSOL. TSOL was, out with, was without any original members. Then the original members tried to reunite as TSOL and were told by the new TSOL that they didn't have any legal standing to do so because they had sold the name to them. Like, it's crazy, like mind-boggling to think. And that, you know, now they're like a, sort of like a hair metal TSOL kind of band, you know? It's just so, so crazy how this stuff works, right? Um in in the case of Black Flag and Flag, here you have Greg Ginn, the guy who 
founded the band, right? Or the 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 one of the main founders of the band, the 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 songwriter of the band, and the one constant member of the band. He gets three other guys. It's so invocative of what we just read in this book. He gets three other guys and goes out as Black Flag. He gets that's Mike Valley. That's when Mike Valley starts saying. Well, before that, actually, sorry, I'm getting ahead of myself. Damn, I got ahead of myself. So he had started doing shows with Ron again, right? Ron Race. They, they, but they had been playing. You know, uh, Greg Ginn had the Greg Ginn band in the '90s, and and Ron Ron had played. Ron had played. Had got up on and played with him on stage in as early as 1994. Uh, not not to mention the reunion show that everything went black reunion show that they had done in 83 after he had split from the band in 1980. You know what I'm saying? Um, I, yes. And Joe Wood, Joe Wood was Jack's brother-in-law. That's right. They, they, they share. I mean, Joe's, Joe's children, Joe's, Joe's biological children are, are, biologically related to jack and they live you know they freaking live together too like it's crazy it's it's so crazy yes they they had to call themselves by their name for that live 91 uh lp it's crazy so freaking crazy um chad thank you for joining and becoming a member much appreciated we appreciate your support here truly truly same thing with 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 all of our uh patreons as well we love you um Hold on, guys. I'm trying to keep it all straight. I can't. I've got to ignore the comments for a minute. It's as tempting as it is to talk because I'm trying to keep it all in my head here. We're, we're on. We're on a track. We're, we're already at two hours. Jesus Christ. We've got to get to the bottom of this beef. So, as I remember, so Ron Ray's joins joins Gin and they form their they form Black Flag again and they get two other guys and they're going out as Black Flag and they put out. They're going to put out that album, What The, which is like, just, ugh. <laughs> what the, why is so crazy? <laughs> um, they're, they're going to put out this thing. At the same time, we just talked about the Golden Voice reunion. They're getting together and they call themselves Flag. Now, here's the thing. To me, when 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 I hear all you 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 fans and and you guys are, are are bigger fans of Black Flag than I am. So I, I don't want to take away your feelings about Greg Ginn and, you know, him being the soul or whatever, Greg Ginn being Black Flag. I don't want to take that away. But I, as an as a someone with, with less horse in the race, I think that, I think that, you know, what makes Flag as legitimate in its own way is that a first of all they're not going they're not trying to be the alternate black flag they're not out there saying we're black flag they're calling themselves flag it makes perfect sense they have every right to call themselves flag you know especially with the logo it's on the thumbnail of this video how they present it it's flag playing the music of black flag with the the, the names of the people in the band now whether they were supposed to do that legally or not it's it's i i think that it has a ton of integrity and that's what i'm getting at it's integrity dude it's totally integrity they just they they they're going out there they they have they didn't write these songs per se but they love these songs let's go let's dive into the stuff let's let's dive into the stuff here um we're gonna start. Let's let's pull up our let's pull up one of these these guys. Now, we talked up earlier about how we talked earlier about how there were unpaid royalties. Duke left. Dukowski left when he found out that that royalties were not being paid. Keith Morris um, w was also really upset about never you know getting any kind of money there had been talk they had been talking about doing um you know what instead of trying to like t say all this stuff off the top of my head let's go to the actual thing we're going to read from this we'll use this as our guide okay so this is from the village voice and this is an interview right before they did that show i was speaking about that i went to go see with tsol and and flag um 
they uh this was this was uh chuck dukowski's this was chuck dukowski talking in village voice so what ends up happening what base here's what ends up happening right they uh greg sues flag that's what this the, the biggest beef of all is they they he they sue flag um trying to put a stop to them playing as flag because all these guys have gotten together now and they want to play as flag and separate from this that going on you have uh keith morris and henry rollins and by extension chuck dukowski have tried to file um all sorts of trademarks and and greg ginn and sst records are filing injunctions to prevent um these trademarks from being taken over but here's the thing this is the dumb thing greg ginn never registered any of this stuff he assumed that nobody would dare go after black flag the name or the bars logo and as a result uh, there is a japanese clothing company that has the trademark of black flag it doesn't belong i don't think it belongs to them or at least at this point in time it didn't belong to them so it had kind of like lapsed they were trying to get like trainers because here's the thing they wanted they were going to try and get they had a plan um uh henry and keith had a plan they they went to they they met up with chuck and they they all had a pow at henry's house and the plan was we're gonna um get get a hold of as many masters as we can and we're gonna try and put these put uh reissue these songs and they had to bake the same thing with the baking of the tapes and as we said before with, when you bake the tapes, because tapes, analog tape that was manufactured at a certain time in the 70s and the 80s um, is incredibly unstable because of the compounds they used. Older tape doesn't have this problem. And eventually when they realized that tape had this manufacturing defect, they went back to using or they changed the formula of the tape. So there's there are there are countless tapes that were recorded on by famous bands at this time or the tapes they need to be baked you have to bake them in an oven and that gives them uh i guess that gives them enough elasticity or whatever we had somebody on who talked about it who talked about it with some expertise way more than i could but basically you can run them through the player one more time and you basically get one pass at digitizing this material after you bake the tapes and that was the the daunting process that they were going to have to deal with if they wanted to put out these remasters so they were they were like they had to like and they were trying to file that's when they were trying to file the stuff and i apologize if this sounds so uh scatterbrained and disorganized i just i i don't have i'm trying it was very hard to sort of it was very hard to sort of put all of this stuff together um to put all of the the this stuff chronologically together there's not a lot on it with dates and stuff so it's kind of hard to whatever in any case let me just keep talking here sorry try my best um <clears throat> uh, my voice is killing me right now um okay flag so we're just jumping into this interview i'm not reading you the full interview we're going from excerpt to excerpt to give context to this beef to the latest beef so this is the Village Voice talking to Dukowski and asking him questions. Flag has now been playing. They're doing a tour with TSOL. That's where we are in this time for time stream right now. Ready? Flag and the current Black Flag have, have similar set lists. In your mind, how is seeing Flag show different from seeing a current Black Flag show? Dukowski says, I think we honor the spirit of the music and play it in the way we know it needs to be played. We are not trying to be ironic. There is no wink, I scammed you. We deliver for the audience and we deliver for ourselves. The better we play, the more fun it is. The flag set includes most of my songs and Dez's songs and Keith's songs from the Black Flag era. We embrace our past just like we embrace our present. It has made us who we are. So the integrity of this flag, not only are they calling themselves flags, so they're not trying to go out as Black Flag. They're saying who is in the band and they're playing songs from the era. It's for them. It's I, I don't. I mean, of course, it's a. It, they they want to get paid, and of course, they're they're making good guarantees. I would imagine, but this is about so much more than that. This is about reuniting and feeling a certain way. You know what it is? It's like it's like a high school reunion, but it's not like it's not fucking lame. It's not lame in the way 
of Greg Ginn being like a, you know, 60 something year old man going out with a bunch of guys who are way younger than him, just playing songs like no, no values. It just doesn't feel instead when you watch flag, you're watching a bunch of uh, older guys, mature guys who, who uh, are in the uh, sort of like, you know, the twilight years of their careers in some way, shape or form, uh, basically reliving their glory for them. It's a personal thing. I felt that. And I'll tell you something, when they talked about the emotion, there is nothing more emotional than watching uh, Chuck Dukowski play the song, my war. It is like watching him do that song at Irving Plaza. Like it gave me chills up my spine to I, I, my eyes, you know, I said my eyes were glued on Bill Stevenson playing the drums. They were, but when they weren't glued on Bill Stevenson during my war, they were glued on Chuck Dukowski as he so like you could feel, you could just, you could, you could just sense his energy, his soul, his heart, like uh, the, 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 the frustration, the emotion, the anger, the, whatever the catharsis catharsis is the right word. You could feel the catharsis well up in the room in Dukowski as they're playing this song. He was a ferocious Wolverine playing the song and and there's just nothing quite like it. And, you know, I didn't see black flag, the the black flag with Mike Valley and and Greg Ginn, but I'll tell you something. I I just don't imagine. I can't imagine it uh, 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 being anywhere like it was anything like it was with that flag. It was just so, it was so great besides black flag. What are the three? No, this is not what we want. What besides black flag through your SST what is it here? Here, ready? Here it is. What would you say is your worst memory about SST and best memory? Dukowski says my worst memory of SST was going to jail for contempt of court so that black flag could continue to use their name. That's what it was. They couldn't, they were, they couldn't release black. They couldn't release music as black flag because of unicorn records. That's what had happened in 1982. Um, they, uh, I had already been muscled out of the band. I, I really went to jail for Henry Rollins. He had only recently joined black flag. I felt responsible for him. I had chosen him to sing and I wanted him to have a future. There are too many good memories for me to choose just one. People complain, but I had a great time. It was work, but it was beautiful. It was important. I feel grateful for it. All right. Now here's, okay, here's the nitty gritty. Um, Ready? Uh, You were in SST from the beginning, co-owner till 1990. And then, okay, so I was wrong. He didn't leave in 89, but he was a co-owner till 1990. And I guess that changes what I said about signing bands right i you know i said look at all the bands that were signed in the 80s and then chuck left and then look look at what was signed in the 90s but i guess chuck was still there but maybe he wasn't signing bands anymore he says you were the co-owner till 1990 then you worked there through the 90s what was uh what was exactly your role after you quit black flag in 83 until you left for good He says, I was a full partner in SST until the end of 1989. I did every job there was to do, including pick bands, which I was good at. There was so so much great music put out by SST at one time. You had Sonic Youth, The Meat Puppets, Husker Du, The Minutemen. There was so much wonderful music. It was inspiring. After I left Black Flag, I went to Germany where my mother was from. I thought I would stay there. I came back to the U.S. to serve my time in jail for the Black Flag contempt charge. The partners uh, the partners in SST Records at the time asked me to come back and help run the label, and I did. Eventually, I sold my partnership in SST and started a family. I continue to work for SST for a while without realizing how Greg was stealing from everyone. I wish I had realized sooner I quit the day I did. So the day he found out he quit. When was that? And and here's the one thing I don't understand. And I'm not going to accuse Duke of trying to save face here, but like, how could you be the co-founder and so integral to the SST operation and not know that Greg was stealing from everyone? Like, is that just, you said you did every job in the place. So how did you not, how could you not know what Greg was doing? That's what I don't understand. And maybe there's, I, again, I I don't know. I ultimately don't know. And I don't want to believe that that could be possible, man. I don't want to believe that, that Chuck, Chuck doesn't seem like that kind of guy. Chuck seems like an awesome dude. As a matter of fact, 
That's a guy I'd love to friggin' talk to an interview. Um, I can't imagine him doing anything like that. But at the same time, I have to ask myself the question, like, how do you not know what's going on? So I don't know. How did the SST model evolve or devolve from the early years from, say, 1990 and on? He says, you can just look at all the groundbreaking albums that SST released to the lame vanity label it is today. It's tragic. Um, then uh, Voice asks, you had a, pro a project brewing with Eugene Robinson from Oxbow called Blackface where you'll be performing your songs and tunes you wrote while in Black Flag. Recently, Robinson said you bailed out on it. What happened? Will Blackface or some iteration of it materialize? Eugene is incredible. Uh, 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 Duke says, Eugene is an incredibly talented and, and great. Uh, what an intense performer. He is unique in this world. I'm so proud of the single we released. It is powerful and chilling. I am not ruling out doing something again someday. It just wasn't the right time for me. In that interview with Robinson, this is the voice talking. He says he mentioned that he actually got a check from uh, Gin for an Oxbow record SST put out in 1989. It's been well documented that Gin owes people money. Keith expressed that in the off song, I Got News For You. So there's an off song that Keith Morris wrote about Greg Ginn. So two songs have been written by Greg Ginn, about Greg Ginn. My War and I Got News For You for Off. And in the interview, the voice we did with him, dot, dot, dot. And then uh, we're going to read that in a second. Duke says, Ginn has been inconsistent with his payments to me. My understanding is that he owes money to Keith and to Henry. That said, and now, and that's what led to Keith and Henry and Duke all getting together and trying to, trying to figure out a way to sort of a get paid, get all the other members paid and put out the music in the right proper way. Um, that said, if you were to venture a guess on how much money Gin owes you, what would that amount of be? And he goes, oh, geez, I'd have to have a marshal go into his Texas office to demand payments it's crazy um voice asks why do you think gin doesn't honor his debts and duke says honestly there's no logic to it that i can't understand when you got word of the lawsuit that he filed against keith and rollins what was the first thought that crossed your mind and then here's what we find out greg actually sued all of us so greg sued everybody right i mean that's nuts Greg actually sued all of us. He is still trying to get a restraining order against Flag from performing. It was it was surreal to see the legal papers released by the Hollywood Reporter before we had even been served ourselves. So they found out from the Hollywood Reporter before they were even served. That's crazy. Um, so that's the first part. That's that's one part that we're going to look at. Now we're going to we're going to go back one year prior. And by the way, here are the lyrics to I Got News For You. This is the off. These are the off lyrics to the song. Hold on. Coming up one second. But a boom, but a bing, but a bong, but a bingo. I got news for you. You think you're the king of the scene that you've created. I've got news for you. Didn't you expect us to? Uh, did you expect us to worship? I've got news for you. I've got news for you. You bet I got something against you too. All my friends tell you are screwed and piss whatever paying. I've got news for you. I've got news for you. You bet I got something against you. So that's a song that that Keith wrote, or those are lyrics that Keith wrote about Gin in his band called Off. Okay. Um, oh, I'm glad, glad I could be a friend. Throwing you the devil horns. Oh, we're going to get there. He did. He did Sue Rollins. Hold on. Guys, I want to apologize that I don't have, like, it was very hard to sort of piece this all together. It was not easy. It was really, 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 really not easy. So real quick, let's go. Let's now jump over to, now we're going to jump here. I'm going to close these tabs out so we can um, keep track of where we are. We're, we're getting through it, guys. We're getting through it. Taking a little bit of time, but we're getting there. Okay. So now this is Keith Morris. This is one year earlier. I think it's from 2012. That all set. So we're just jumping right into it. We're not reading the full interview because we'll be here all night. We're already here all night. 
That all said, this is the interviewer for voice. That all said, you've been on the outs with SST Records proprietor Greg Ginn essentially since you exited the uh, exited Black Flag back in 1979. Um, uh, Keith says, um, I could almost do a Keith Morris impression. I can't. Um, we, we tried to, no, I can't do it. I'm not going to try. We tried to make up, tried to be punk rock boyfriends. I'm just being facetious. Of course, I'm writing a book and one of the chapters in the book, he did put out that, but oh, I should read that book. That's a book to read. Uh, I'm writing a book and one of the chapters in the book will be what happened when he and I tried to get back together. There was a scenario where black flag was going to play a couple of reunion shows at a place called the Hollywood Palladium. We talked about this already in 2003, the Hollywood Palladium is a space that if you jam in full of people, if you jam in full of people, there's 5,000 people in there. I was asked by the promoters to come in and make sure, you know, Robo was going to perform and Des and Ron Reyes and Henry and Chuck Dukowski and Kira uh, was going to be there. It was going to be all this. It was going to be this truly amazing thing. Once I started to get involved and started to take the bull by the horns, I got gouged by the bull. It got really ugly. I'd only rehearsed twice when I left the rehearsals. It was like, you know what? I got to start making calls. I got to make sure these guys are going to be here because if it's going to be anything like what these rehearsals have been, I'm not going to be there. It started to spiral into this. He said uh, this and you're talking ish and you've been spreading vicious rumors it turned very like third or fourth grade, like little kids pointing fingers at each other. And I didn't want to have anything to do with that. All of a sudden, I started to see the head trip, the skull, the skull drug, druggery. That's a great word, skull druggery. The BS started to rise up. I was starting to feel the bad vibes. And I realized that this is pretty much the same reason why I left in the first place. Uh, the voice asked, were the bad vibes mainly coming from Gin or from other black flag members as well? Now, well, let's see what he says here. Let's see. Let's see what he says here. Well, in the psych department, in the head trip department, we have to say, we have to say anybody that looks at the situation and you look at the list of credits and you look at the mastermind, black flag is Greg Ginn's band. So here is Keith, the, the, the co one of the co-founders and, you know, the, the lead singer of flag saying that black, black, fully admitting that black flag is Greg Ginn's band. Now I've talked to a few other people and Keith Morris says, that's right. Greg Ginn was the mastermind. Greg Ginn wrote some pretty brilliant songs, but all of us stumbled into something. We didn't know what we were creating, but the fact of the matter is you can't have a band unless you have other people playing in the band and you can't go up on stage with just a guy and his guitar playing those songs. It just doesn't work. There has to be some other people. There has to be a Ron or a Des. There has to be a Billy or a Kira. There has to be a Chuck the Duke. There has to be a Johnny Bob Goldstein. It doesn't work any other way. I'm an administrator on the Black, on the Black Flag Facebook page, and I'm one of the guys that has to deflect some of the BS. A lot of people get on there and want to immediately grind on Henry. Henry in Black Flag. I saw him perform with Black Flag twice, and they were pretty amazing. At one of their performances, I was in tears. I couldn't move. I was paralyzed. When I walked away, I was crying. I was thinking to myself, why did I quit this band? One of the greatest bands I'd ever been a part of, but also one of the greatest bands I'd ever seen perform. So I got to let everybody know you don't got to badmouth any of the people in this band because everybody put in their time and had stuff thrown at them and had their lives threatened. We were constantly having the police kick in our door and making us vacate a space at three in the morning, five in the morning, grab whatever you can and run. Um, but you know, what he is speaking to, and again, going back to this notion of what makes up the heart and the soul of a band, everybody says Greg Ginn is black flag. Greg Ginn is the mastermind of black flag, but all of these people, they are black flag. All of them. They are the heart and the soul of black flag. And that's why that you can go to a flag show and feel the energy and spirit of black flag even if you don't have gin on guitar stefan does a great job just you know doing a gin a gin thing is it is it gin no of course not is is you know would it be better to have gin of course it would but that's never going to happen and these guys are not trying to make you think that they're black flag either they're just going we're flag 
we want to perform these songs that mean something to us, that we bled for, that we poured our hearts and soul into. You know what I mean? And like I said, when when I saw Flag Live, when I saw Flag Live, like it didn't feel like a cash grab. It felt like a bunch of older dudes looking back on their accomplishments and reliving something, not something that they felt was sustainable because flag ultimately, and they still exist. Like I think they've put on or attempted to put on shows, you know, COVID might've gotten in the way of some stuff like flag flag still, you know, um, uh, flag still kind of exists, but flag is not like a real entity. They don't, they don't, I don't think they think of themselves as anything more than a moniker to go out and perform these songs that mean something to them. You know what I'm saying? Like it, like more of like a, a, an ensemble, a super group ensemble that, that, you know, um, dredges up these songs positively dredges, dredges up these songs in a way, uh, to, to relive those glory days. Like I said, when you see Greg Ginn, out there with Mike Valley and whoever that kid Brendan who would end up in Doyle's band he's a great friggin drummer he's he drum for suicidal tendencies phenomenal drummer and I don't I have nothing no knocks on that kid nothing bad to say about him truly but I'm just saying when you have so we won't even talk about it. we'll talk about somebody else in that in in that band when you have somebody when you have all these other people it feels like Gin is just so he's just trying to desperately hold on to his, his, his place, you know? Um, yeah, exactly. Ace four to five members of the band is more than the band than just getting on his own. It's true. This is getting you emotional, man. That's beautiful. <laughs> and they, that's awesome, dude. I'm glad, <laughs> I'm glad you're I'm glad you're feeling that way. Um, but, but, you know, because Gin is not playing with anybody from the black flag days, feels like an insecure guy desperately an insecure king desperately trying to retain power of his throne of his of his nation of his whatever that's what it feels like that's what i see when i watch those videos i just see it just it, it doesn't i'm like that's black flag that's not black flag you know when you watch that moose lodge video of them and they jump into revenge it's not my imagination i got a gun to my it's just like you feel that you feel the turbo charge when you see like Chuck Dukowski's face and that weird way that he plays his bass. Like, it's, it's so great, man. It's so freaking great. It's so freaking great. I've watched that video so many times. It's a great, great video. We're going to get revenge. You won't, you know, I'll tell you something every time I, I, I will say, um, I, I told you I'm not, super into black flags music but there's nothing like working at a job that you friggin hate like that like a day job that you hate and your boss like just grinds on you and then you get into your car and you throw on revenge and you just like you you just like it's so cathartic man it just it just lets all that frustration out you know and that's what I feel when I see flag. I feel them like, like pouring out their frustration and anger and ferocity, like in a positive way, like they're getting it out, you know, and you don't get that with black flag with, with Gin's Gin flag. That's what we'll call it. Gin flag and flag. Right. Um, so it appears that most of the ex members of black flag are on good terms, but Gin is the isolated one. He says he chose to be the isolated one. He being the creator and being the guy who he was also brought in a lot of BS on himself. And uh, in some of his moves, brought, brought a lot of BS onto himself in some of his moves and the way that he practiced his business and just some of the terrible things he's done. So again, I'm sorry to keep interrupting, but um, the, here is a perfect example the old expression is the whole is greater than the sum of its parts. Yeah, totally, dude. Totally. Totally. I mean, that's look at the Beatles, dude. Th th those guys, those four guys made up the Beatles. But when they split up and they were doing their solo albums, nothing was as great as when they were in the Beatles. Because the Beatles 
were so much more than four musicians getting together. Beatles were the Beatles became a thing. They became this 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 thing that was greater than the sum of its four parts, as you say, you know, and nothing. John Lennon's solo material couldn't compare. Paul has been trying to write songs for 50 years. He finally got a number one album after how many years with Egypt Station? Actually, a really good album. I enjoyed it. Enjoy also McCartney three. Really great. Um, but Paul has a lot of dreck, a lot of solo dreck in, in between, in between stuff. Let's, let's also take a look at this. This is important too, with all this lawsuit stuff, with everything that's going on and these guys, and he's not the only one. And you could listen, we could talk about uncle Glenn too here. You know, that he's another, another great example of a dude who, you know, uh, you know, there was a class action suit against Glenn and, you know, money had to be paid and Glenn ended up keeping the publishing, but lost the rights to write and record as the misfits. Not that he even wanted to in the first place. And he didn't have to pay the the settlement because he had Caroline do it because, well, that was a good business move. But point being is that him and Gin and all these guys, like if they just paid, if they just paid the royalties, they would save themselves so much money. Think about all of the money that's spent in court trying to keep you know a, a class action lawsuit at bay because you just simply don't pay it's just like like it just doesn't make any sense it, in the long run you're gonna save more money by keeping everybody happy by giving them the 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 royalties that they deserve it's like it's like it's not even about like being greedy or not greedy it's just good it's just a good business practice like if you want to do something that's like sustainable in business then then pay the people what they're owed royalty wise because if they get paid they'll stay happy they're not going to they're not going to come barking around you know what's funny and here's the here's the true irony let's say that and i don't know what the number is but let's say for instance cuz i know this i know that keith morris in this in this lawsuit thing or whatever that was going on like recently he was he had he was going to have to surrender his part of the deal was that he would surrender his the lyrics that he had written for black flag in exchange for merchant for merch royalties uh over five hundred dollars a month or something i forgot what it was something like that and he was willing he was willing and able to do it right so imagine for a second that let's say that i don't know how well black flag has said who knows how much money gin has made as an independent label owner, I mean, he's probably made millions of dollars off of that catalog, right? You, you'd have to imagine, or at least six figures, or you know, maybe like a million dollars. Who knows? Just a lot, a lot of money. I mean, look, Fat Mike has made millions of dollars, right? Something like that. Um, but imagine for a moment that Gin was like, "All right, I'm gonna, pay, I, 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 I'm gonna pay royalties." but I'm not going to, I'm going to still rip these guys off. I'm just not going to give them the full amount. You think that if, if Keith Morris was getting a check for $800 a month from Gin without fail, and let's say that, all right, let's make this really crazy. Let's say that it was actually $1,200 that he was owed and he should be paid the full $1,200. I, I, that's not what I'm saying here. I'm just saying, we're thinking of this from Gin's perspective. He's only paying the dude eight hundred dollars and he's thinking in his head well i'm paying the eight hundred dollars that i don't want to pay because i don't want to pay royalties because i'm a you know pos or, you know I'm a, I'm a jerk but you know uh i'm gonna pay this eight hundred dollars and i'll keep the 400 extra dollars and that keith morris is probably going you know uh not questioning it or maybe he's not questioning it because he's getting a fat check every month not that eight hundred dollars is a fat check but i don't know you know, in the nineties, in between bands, in between jobs. I don't know what Keith Morris does for a living. I don't know how he makes money. You know, he's talked about he's talked about uh the frustration of not making money off of his music and his art. So I don't know. I, I'm just saying, like, you'd imagine that if a paycheck was coming in and it was fat enough that uh, that was fat enough where you wouldn't question, but that there was that that maybe it wasn't the exact amount that like whoever whoever's paying out that money. Like it would be in their best interest to be paying something. I don't know. I don't know if any of that just made sense. It made sense in my head. I was trying my best to explain it. What I'm basically saying is, even if 
Keith Morris was owed more, he might not raise an eyebrow or question if he was getting most of what he was owed. He would just think in his head, oh, nice, I'm getting a check every month. Not that Keith Morris is foolish or wouldn't know that he's owed more. I'm just simply saying that like, you know, maybe he wouldn't, maybe he wouldn't raise an eyebrow so quick as to be like, hey, I see SST Records is selling my stuff, you know, black flag stuff all the time. And I've never been paid. Like what gives? I want to look into this. I want to do some accounting. Um, yes, I've heard this. I heard that Ian Mackay, who is by the way, like the most it, with the Discord catalog, Discord records, first of all, he is so like scrupulous and so meticulous uh about his record keeping and making sure that everybody gets paid every cent that they are owed he's like the anti-gin in that kind of way it's really really interesting to think about i think rollins is probably worth more than mckay though i'd imagine i don't think i don't think ian's worth more than him i don't know who knows who knows what does it matter uh but interesting it's interesting to talk about it's interesting to talk about this stuff um <clears throat> Yes, we know that Greg Ginn is unironically insane. We're going to get there a little bit. Um, you were obviously tight with Raymond Pettibon. His his artwork graces the covers of Black Flag and Off's records, and he's in your band's videos. Pettibon is Ginn's brother, and the two haven't spoken in many years. Well, Raymond got the treatment the same way a lot of us got, uh, and a lot of other people were treated, you know. Blah, 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 blah. We were all treated the same way. Uh, how about a royalty statement? How about a list of how many records have been sold or CDs or T-shirts or what have you? None of that ever appears. And Raymond, his brother, he just, you know, I think the mentality is, well, you're working for Black Flag and you're working for SST. You should be really happy. We're doing you a favor. I think that might be the mentality. There is a huge rift between Henry and Greg, you know, and after after you left the band, you weren't supposed to become successful. You were supposed to wash dishes or going go back to haagen in Washington, D.C. and sell little cups full of ice cream. And that's not how it works. Um, recently, The Voice sat down with Joe Car Carducci, who helped run SST from 81 to 86. Do you recall anything about Carducci? Well, here's the thing about Joe. Joe was maybe second or third generation SST. See, I was first generation. Uh, we were the first stuff that came out on N SST. By then I was gone, gone after that first Black Flag EP. We did so we did some recording. We tried to record an album's worth of material, and I'm sure some of that stuff has surfaced here and there. I know a lot of people that have worked for SST over the years, and they don't necessarily conform to the owner of the label just because the owner is a dick. Doesn't mean that people that work for him are dicks. Carducci has a blog that he puts up like once a month and he's actually really, really cool. You know, a lot of great photos, some really cool stories. I got, I get his blog and I guess I'm a member of, I guess I'm a member of the crew that gets the blog and I find it very interesting and I'm glad and happy he's doing what he's doing. You know, there aren't a lot of people that, uh, this is all blah, 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 blah. There was a period in the eighties where both you and Chuck Biscuits were in circle jerks together. Both of you were in black flag at different points. Did you ever talk to Chuck about being in black flag? Um, Chuck Biscuits at one point was asked to play in Loverboy. What, uh, what would have happened if he had played in Loverboy? Then he wouldn't have gone from DOA. To, then he would have gone from DOA to Loverboy and he would have skipped out on the real fun dance. We never talked about Black Flag. This was a period of time, uh, where we were in the van. It's all about survivors, being a survivor, going from town to town. Hopefully, uh, the promoter doesn't stiff you. Hopefully a bunch of people show up. You know, we were doing these things. Watt Mike Watt seems to pride himself on the fact that he could go to 60 shows in 40 days. Watt's like, I'm just ready to run myself into the ground and uh, off myself as soon as possible. Well, we went through that. There was a time and a place where it was where there was no all ages unless it was the Moose, Moose Lodge or the Elks Lodge or the Masonic uh, Temple or the VFW Hall. Um. This is this is irrelevant. You're not frowning upon what Watts does. Uh, you're over the van and playing in clubs. So you get flack from the old punk type people. All right, I think we can move on from this interview. Your lyrics for some off songs have been interpreted as responses to Black Flag Gin situation. Most notably, I got news for you. Well, I think that's the beautiful thing that people can read into it uh, like that. 
uh, you know, because most of these lyrics aren't that blatant, even though they are pretty black and white. How about the fact that maybe, you know, somebody screwed you over? You bet I got something against you, too. Like I said, when I left the band, there was a lot of finger pointing. The black flag troops and all of their people and their co-conspirators, they were not happy with me and some of the things I did in the Circle Church. But we're over that. That's way far back in the past. Um, I'm trying to see if there's anything else here. I think that's prob probably about it for that one. Uh, okay, now we're going to move on to... Okay, here is, so now here is a proper, this is how the reunion started, according to Duke. We're coming, to, we're coming to the end, guys. We're coming to the end. We're going to, we're coming to the lawsuit part. How did the flag, this is from uh, PKM. How did the, the, how did the flag reunion ha happen circa 2013? And will we see flag continue or are there still legal messes with black flag, et cetera? Duke says, flag happened as a byproduct of me successfully suing SST Greg Ginn several times for unpaid royalties. So how about that? So eventually, and here's the thing. Well, I'll let, I'll let, let Duke say it, and I don't need to say it. My wife and I literally had to learn how to be lawyers because Ginn's whole strategy was to, to, to get you with the legal fees until you had to settle. That is what a lot of people with money do. That's what they do. If they Even if they can't win, you could be right. You could be right in a situation, but if you don't have the money for the lawyers to prove it in a court of law, then you're going to get, um, you, you're going to get, run into the ground you're not gonna you're gonna bankrupt yourself you're it's gonna be a pyrrhic victory which means you may win eventually but the uh, the cost will be so great to you that it what's the point in in the first place that sort of thing um and so but but chuck i guess chuck eventually did get some royalties without the immediate threat of being sued for doing anything black flag related i was able to play some black flag songs with the band no age at a free show they organized i rehearsed no age on some songs and they invited keith to sing a year or so later gary tovar the founder of golden voice productions asked me to say a few words at a 30-year anniversary event they were promoting i suggested that i pull some strings and play a few black flag songs with keith on vocals and the descendants drummer and guitarist i had bigger ideas but i couldn't make them stick i wanted to have all the black flag members do their era songs and henry initially said yes but then he changed his mind and I scaled back plans. And we've heard what Henry has had to say about this. And here's the thing. We haven't really talked about Henry much in relation to this, but you know, Henry was part of the spearhead to sort of trademark this stuff. And he wasn't doing it on his own. He was doing it. First of all, Greg had never done anything with the stuff. And here's the thing. I'm not saying this is right. I'm not saying I agree with this. Greg was the one Greg. All right, this is really crazy to say, and you may disagree with me, but technically, Black Flag never really stopped existing on a technical level, if you think about it. From a, this is really pedantic. This is so, this is pedantic semantics. It's not true. Black Flag did break up in 1986. So what I'm about to say is just incredibly pedantic. I just want to put that out there. Um. Gin quit his own band. He left. He left. Um, wait, I'm on the phone with Tom. <laughs> I'm on the phone with Tim from Junkyard right now. Whoever just mentioned them, ironic, talking about Baker and Discord. And <laughs> that's cool. Um, okay. So, so uh, Gin left before Henry did. He called up Henry. And he said, Henry, I'm leaving the band. Henry goes, what do you mean you're leaving the band? Okay, you can't leave the band. It's your band. And Gin's like, no, I'm out. Henry didn't quit Black Flag. I mean, the band dissolved. The band is gone. But technically, Henry was the last man standing as Black Flag. Gin quit the band, leaving Henry with the thing. I'm not saying that if Henry had gone out and decided to just be Black Flag on his own, 
it, it wouldn't have been legitimate. It would have been ridiculous. It would have been a whole, uh, it would have been, it would have been on the pile of people for, for forever more would go. It's not black flag without Greg Ginn. And they would be right to say that. Okay. Um, it, 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 so what we're saying is, yes, it is pedantic. It is pedantic semantics. <laughs> What about idiosyncratic magic? That's too long. But these titles are too long for band names. That's the problem. In any case, um, but in a court of law, if Henry Rollins had continued with that black flag name or it, uh, had fostered that black flag name or, you know, wanted to do something with those marks, I imagine from a legal standpoint that he might hold some water to do so. I don't know. I honestly don't know. Would it be right? Is Do I think it's right? No. But he, technically, it was Ginn who quit the band. But then again, you could also argue Glenn Danzig left the Misfits. You know, the, the Misfits broke up. You could say Glenn Danzig left the Misfits. That doesn't mean that the Misfits still exist without Glenn Danzig. The Misfits need Glenn Danzig in order to be the Misfits, right? So it doesn't really, it's, 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 it's ridiculous. It's a ridiculous point. I don't even know why I made it, but I, I'm just saying that maybe from some sort of legal angle, because that's kind of how trademark works a little bit. If you don't use the marks, you have to show them that you why the marks are valuable to you. Because if you don't use the marks, if you la la let the marks lapse for 30 years, which is what happened in the case of Black Flag for both Henry and for Ginn and anybody they all let the marks lapse. None of them had a more legitimate like claim to the marks than say the other ones did. Uh, at least as far as I understand from the lawsuit that we're about to look at. Um, so they, they had, so that's kind of what's going on there. They scaled back plans. They couldn't put together this giant thing that they were initially wanted to do in 2003 and they couldn't do it there. We had a good time at the golden voice show and decided to do a flag tour. Uh, Gin sued us anyway which sucked, but we were able to defend him in the end. Flag is going to play punk rock bowling in Las Vegas 2019. PKM, so is the, is that it? Is that it? Is that it? Yeah, that's it. So that explains that. So Gin does get sued by Dukowski and his wife, and I guess they settle at some point, and I believe that was in 2007, because what happened next is, See, I tried to find here. Is this the one that we want? This is the final piece of the pie, guys. All right, this is the big one, not the big one. But here's an overview of of the of the lawsuit after this long ass show. Oof. I haven't done a marathon show like this. Great way to start off the year, huh? Just dive into it. What is this? Is this uh this is Part one. All right, ready? Here we go. So here it is. This is SST Records Inc. versus Garfield. Garfield is, that's Henry's last name is Garfield. He got Rollins off the side of a truck. Rollins truck, I guess. SST Records Inc., a Texas corporation. Let's make this a little bit bigger because I can't see crap. A Texas corporation, Greg R. Oh, we didn't need to read that. Whatever they're they're suing. So here's who's being sued. Henry's being sued. Henry is a defendant. Keith Morris is a defendant. Gary McDaniel, aka Chuck Dukowski, is a defendant. Um, Des, aka Dennis Paul, is a is a defendant. Uh, John William Stevenson, aka Bill Stevenson, is, and Stephen Egerton. Am I saying that right? Because some people say Stephen Stephen King, like you'd say Stephen King. But I think he the phonetic the phonetic pronunciation is Stefan. Okay, so here's the so this is what's cool. Here is here's some background. Ready? Presently, before the court is the plaintiff's SST Records and Gregory Ginn's motion for a pr preliminary injunction. What is an injunction? It means that like to legally stop someone from doing something via via a court. Okay, ready? Um. So 
Greg Ginn's motion for a preliminary injunction, having considered the submissions of the parties and heard oral argument, the court denies the motion and adopts the following order. So the so initially Ginn is saying, I am want to block these guys from doing what they're doing. The court has denied this and instead adopts a following order. But first, the background. In 1976, here is a, a this is a court oral history. So it's not from the book. This is from, this is as close as you get from, from the, from the cat's mouth, right? From the mouth of the people, uh, you know, of the, of the, I mean, it's, it's akin to getting a, a, I guess a legal interview from Greg Ginn under, under the, you know, a uh, court of law. Does that mean that he could exaggerate or lie? Of course, but like, it's just, this is officially legally on the record you know, uh, uh, the, the situation or the, 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 you know, the history of the band in 1976, Greg Ginn and defendant Keith Morris formed a band, which defendant Gary McDaniel, also known as Chuck Dukowski later joined. This is the declaration of Gregory Ginn in 1978, the band changed its name to black flag. So I guess the band started in 76 with Keith Morris. And that was Panic. And that's when Spot and Raymond, they were they were bass players. In 1978, the band changed its name to Black Flag and played its first paid show under this name in January of 1979. So they didn't actually play as Black Flag until 1979. Between 1979 and 1986, several people joined and or left Black Flag, including defendants uh, Des Kadena, uh, Bill Stevenson and Garfield, also known as Henry Rollins. The parties dispute their various roles in the band. So everybody who's in this thing disputes what their role was in the band for at least some period of time. The band considered itself to be a statutory partnership. I'm going to look up what statutory means in relation to, I don't know what that, I don't know. Uh, it's not going to let me do the lookup thing. Uh, whatever. All right. Someone look up statutory real quick. Statutory partnership, making de look up the definition of statutory partnership, not just statutory. Um, uh, making decisions by majority. So the majority of the band is making the decision. So even though Greg Ginn is the mastermind, they're making d democratic decisions, at least according to this court document, distributing earnings evenly and submitting tax filings as the black flag partnership. This is from uh, a Dukowski declaration. So Dukowski at some point, and this is evidence, or this is an exhibit. If this is actually called exhibit a, it's from uh, du Dukowski's declaration that there was a black flag partnership where they did this sort of stuff. Um, SST of which Gin is the sole remaining shareholder released and distributed all of Black Flag's 18 albums. And that's from Gin's declaration. So you have Dukowski's declaration and Gin's declaration. Um, at other times, Dukowski listed Black Flag as his sole proprietorship, allegedly at Gin's request. So that means that maybe during business dealings or for some unknown business purpose that Gin had Dukowski, hey, just say that this is all you for whatever the reason is. And we don't know what that means or what 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 that's in reference to, but that's what that's what it is. Black Flag also adopted a logo consisting of four uneven black bars simulating a waving flag, the logo that ultimately became a very well-known uh, 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 the what is that? Say? Also became very sorry. That ultimately became very well known. SST manufactures and distributes clothing bearing this logo. Several third parties with no relationship to either Black Flag SST or any of the other parties to the suit also make use of the logo on clothing and promotional materials in various other ways. That's from the Dukowski Declaration. Um, by 1986, Ginn 
and Rollins were the only parties remaining in Black Flag. The parties dispute. Okay, this is interesting. Ready for this, folks? The parties dispute whether Ginn or Rollins. Oh, here we go. Thank you, Eric. Eric says, statutory in this context probably just refers to the length of time these people did business as partners. Okay, thank you. Much appreciated. Oh, God. Oh, I can't believe I just showed that on the screen. Minister. Minister, that's not nice. <laughs> Um, <laughs> by, by 1986, Ginn and Rollins were the only parties remaining in Black Flag. The parties dispute whether Ginn or Rollins was the last member of the band. How about that? All right. <laughs> For all 38 of you who are still here three hours into this broadcast, which by the way, if this is your first time joining us, please make sure to subscribe to this channel, like, leave a comment, super important, very helpful to the, you know, supporting this channel. Remember what I was just saying before about being too pedantic and semantic? Here we go. In a court of law, they are disputing it is important who the last member of the band was. And I guess it could be argued Gin's the last member of the band because Gin is... Gin is going, hey, Henry, I'm leaving the band. And when I leave the band, the band is over. Or Gin is going, I'm leaving the band to Henry. Like, here, here's the keys. Do what you want with Black Flag. I don't care. Either way, neither one of them can decide who's the last member of the band. But then the, the lawsuit says, in or the, the court documents say, in any event, the band broke up and no party performed under the black flag name for almost 20 years until in 2003 certain former members of black flag including gin and kadina played three reunion shows in southern california almost a decade later in december 2011 defendants stevenson morrison morris sorry keith morris dukowski and egerton who had not been a member of Black Flag, performed a single show as Black Flag. Okay, I didn't know that. So they actually did credit themselves as Black Flag for that first show. Interesting. Ooh. Um, I thought they just call, I thought they had always called themselves Flag. You know what? I think that's not, I don't think that's cool. I love that they call themselves Flag. I think that's like the coolest thing. I wish more bands would just take a page out of that book. In July 2012, Dukowski and other defendants came to a decision to play shows as Flag, which they envisioned as a Black Flag tribute band. So here are former members of the band just wanting to play the songs. They just they don't even care. They're calling them. They literally envision themselves as a tribute band. Flag includes all defendants, with the exception of Rollins, who, by the way, has stated and he stated it in the Ruben podcast that I listened to, where he's like, "Look." I don't more power to those guys. I'm done. I don't want to, you know, be singing for my supper at 60 years old. That's what Henry Rollins. And I think he totally he's I think he could be considered right for many other bands that maybe are are doing something that they were doing in their 20s and they're like six, you know, late 60s, early 70s, whatever. I mean, you know, still doing this thing that really is a phantom of their youth and doesn't really make sense to be singing, you know, you know, to be, to be Alice Cooper singing, I'm only 18. I mean, of course we all love Alice Cooper. think Alice Cooper is greater, yada, yada, yada. But like at the end of the day, you know, singing a song, I'm only 18 and like being like 75, it's like weird. You know, I don't know how old Alice Cooper is. I'm just saying that you, it loses, maybe it loses, Maybe it loses some of that bite, but that's what Henry Rollins, that's how Henry Rollins views it. And I think he doesn't understand. We already talked about what the glory is of flag and how it's glorious and why they're doing what they're doing. And I don't think it has anything to do with why Henry Rollins doesn't want to do it, you know, and I respect Henry's decision to not want to retread the past in that kind of way that also totally respect that dude. I get it. 
In September 2012, after the December 2011 Black Flag show, but before Flag began performing, defendants uh, Keith Morris and Henry Rollins filed trademark applications. So this happened after the December 2011 show. Uh, almost a year later in the fall, they filed trademark applications for the name Black Flag and for the logo. Morris and Rollins intended to register the marks on behalf of the Black Flag Partnership. So now here, and this is super friggin', super friggin' important here, okay? Um, for everybody who thinks that Keith Morris and Henry Rollins are trying to steal this for themselves, they weren't. They were trying to steal it for all of them, for the whole, for all the members who never made any money who were never paid they were trying to restore it to the partnership and you want to know something that partnership would include greg ginn that's what he's trying to do that's what it is um it says it right here uh ginn asserts that morris and rollins lied in their trademark application by submitting material belonging to sst because sst belongs to ginn as their own and by falsely, by falsely claiming that they had continuously used the black flag name and logo on merchandise and in live performances. It does not appear that the patent and trademark office has yet acted upon the application. In January of 2013, so that was for that, that public, I mean, that black flag uh, partnership for everybody. In January of 2013, Flag publicly announced that it would begin touring. Uh, Flag's promotional materials featured the band name, the language featuring original members, with the list of all the original members, uh, performing the music of Black Flag. The materials also included a logo compromised of four evenly spaced black bars in a straight line, as opposed to the logo's offset bars. Flag played its first show in April 2013 and is scheduled to finish its 2013 tour on November 8th, 2013. In February 2013, two weeks after Flag announced its tour dates. Okay, this is what I remember. I knew it. I, I friggin' knew it, dude. Flag did it first and then Gin in order to try and protect. That's what he was trying to do. He was just trying to protect. He's trying to protect his little, you know, his, 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 his perceived legacy, you know? Um, Eric says rumors. This was, he's talking about golden voice here. Rumors were buzzing around that day of a show of, uh, blah, rumors were buzzing around that day of that show of a black flag set. And I think they were announced as black flag when they hit the stage. Got it. Um, but Ginn announced two weeks later that he would be touring his black flag. So Ginn had no intention of touring his black flag until flag decided to go and do shows. I mean, it doesn't get any more insecure. It just, it turned into a giant pissing match. I mean, what a buffoon, what a job, like one of the biggest fumbles ever. Black Flag toured in the United States through uh, September 2013. Plaintiffs submit the, de uh, the declaration of Jose Barraza in support of their assertion that Flag sells Black Flag merchandise at Flag shows. The quality of the picture is so poor, however, that it is difficult to tell whether the design on the shirt is the logo or the straight line bars, as well as whether the photo de depicts as plaintiff claims a flag merchandise table at a flag show or a bookcase of some sort. That's weird. On August 2nd, 2013, Ginn and SSD, SST filed this suit for trademark infringement, unfair competition, and breach of contract. The breach of contract is in relation to the settlement that he had with Dukowski because when they settled in, in 2007, when Dukowski had sued Ginn, um, they had one of the part of the settlement was that he could never perform his black flag. That was what Ginn had wanted of Dukowski. So that's breach of contract plaintiffs. Uh, Ginn now seek a preliminary injunction, meaning we want to stop you 
um, enjoining all defendants from using the name Black Flag or the logo. Legal standard. Typically, a private party seeking a preliminary injunction must, one, show that he is likely to succeed on the merits, two, that he is likely to suffer irreparable harm in the absence of pre pre preliminary relief, meaning that if he doesn't get this injunction, that that Gin is going to suffer damages, which is like why he goes, hey, le let me get a bunch of people together and we're going to go out. Hey, Ron, Ron Reyes, let's get up. We're going to go tour as Black Flag. We're going to put out a record. All of this was to stop those guys. It was everything that Black Flag has done post 2003, like Gin. Everything Gin has done as Black Flag in post 2003 is purely out of spite to the other guys at 100%. 100%. So two, that he's likely to suffer irreparable harm in the absence of preliminary relief, that the balance of equities of equities tips in his favor, and four, that the injunction is in the public interest. It is in the public interest that flag doesn't play. And then they, they cite a case for why that is. Preliminary relief may be warranted when a party shows a five combination of probable success on the merits and the possibility of irreparable harm or two raises serious questions and the balance of hardships tips in favor of an injunction. And then they cite another case. These two formulations represent two points on a sliding scale. So there's a sliding scale to determine this stuff. This is insane. This is insane stuff. This is wacky, wild, crazy stuff. Um, uh, my voice is dead. I'm I'm done after this. I'm I'm so done. I can't I can't keep going. I can't believe we just did three hours. I was this was not supposed to be a three hour show at all. These two formulations. I mean, it's me. Like, what do you, what do I expect? <clears throat> These two formulations represent two points on a sliding scale, which they require, which in which the the required degree of irreparable harm increases as the probability of success decreases. Under both formulations, the party must demonstrate a fair chance of success on the merits and the significant threat of irreparable injury. Three, even under serious interest sliding scale test, so it's a sliding scale test, a plaintiff must satisfy four winter factors. What is the winter factor? It doesn't say. Someone look up the winter factors. We need to know what the winter factors are. Um, a plaintiff must satisfy the four winter factors and demonstrate that there is a likelihood of irreparable injury and that the injunction is in the public interest. And that's the, the, you get another, another thing. Three discussion. This is page three of four guys. We're almost, done. <laughs> it's like, I'm really telling myself, I'm not telling you. I'm just like, I can't talk anymore to prevail on a trademark claim. A plaintiff must show that he has some protectable interest in the mark. Uh, beyond ownership, the core element of the trademark infringement claim is the likelihood that the similarity of the marks will confuse consumers as to the sources of goods and services. So that's what is that saying? It's saying that the black flag logo and the flag logo that um, they have to look so similar that it will confuse the public and cause possible hurt to one or the other relevant factors include the strength of the mark proximity of the goods similarity of the marks evidence of actual confusion so this is a lot of stuff that you need to prove in order to make this work evidence of actual confusion marketing channels use degree of care uh likely to be exercised by consumers defendants intent and likelihood of expansion of product lines Ooh. Plaintiffs have not shown a sufficient likelihood of success on the merits to warrant a pre preliminary injunction relief. As uh, an initial matter, even putting aside the question whether either plaintiff owns either of the marks, the court is not persuaded that the plaintiffs can demonstrate. So Gin cannot demonstrate a protectable interest in either the black flag name or logo, neither of which are registered to GIN. So GIN or SST does not register the stuff, but GIN asserts that both marks are extremely well known, which is true. But at some point, marks may transcend their identifying purpose and fall outside the protection of trademark law. That's crazy. 
And there's a case for that from Mattel Inc. versus MCA Records from 2002. Such gener generocide, wow, what a word, generocide, can occur as a result of a trademark owner's failure to police the park. I think that means to police the mark. So that's what it is. Uh, it's failure to uh, of a trademark owner's failure to police the mark, which is Gin did not do that at all. He was convinced that no one would have the gall to do it, resulting in a widespread usage by competitors, leading to a perception of generous generousness amongst, amongst the public who sees many sellers using the same term. So he basically, by not protecting the mark, he basically ran it into the ground in that way. Um, blah, blah, blah. Even if Gin owned, owned the marks, they have allowed them to fall into generic use. By the way, I think the Crimson Ghost. I do. I do. I do. I, but a six-pack of seltzer or coffee. Or coffee, six pack of seltzer or coffee. I agree, DLW. I agree. I, I I think they should just settle this in a ring. Combat trial by combat for this. <clears throat> My voice hurts so bad. I'm, I have to stop you guys. I, I I'm going to. I'm going to as soon as I get through this one more page and then we're done. <clears throat> um, sev several manufacturers, for example, appear to have uh, been distributing unlicensed merchandise featuring the logo since at least 2009 and Gin never stopped them. He didn't do anything without any action from Gin. Indeed, a Japanese company's registration of the black flag. So this is what I was talking about earlier and I couldn't uh, figure it out. Uh, uh, a Japanese company, a Japanese company's registration of the black flag mark in 2008 elicited no response from Greg Gin nor uh, in the years following the band's dispersal in, in 1986 did Gin take any action to maintain the distinctiveness of the marks. So it is therefore doubtful whether the plaintiff, can uh, Gin, can establish that the marks are protectable. So that basically, he can't get an injunction because, you know, he can't prove he, he didn't take care of his marks. Even if Gin could establish a protectable interest in the marks, they have not adequately demonstrated that the marks and flags marks are particularly similar. Similarity of the marks is tested on three levels, sight, sound, and meaning. Each must be considered as they are encountered in the marketplace. Wow. The more similar the marks, the greater the likelihood of confusion. Plaintiffs provide four examples of flag promotional posters or flyers that a consumer might encounter in the marketplace. Each of these examples included immediately adjacent to the name flag and even space bars, uh, the explanatory and undisputedly accurate language featuring original members with all the original members. While the black bars and the word flag bear some visual similarity to the to, to Gin's alleged marks, the inclusion of the explanatory language clearly distinguishes the marks visually and orally, and even more so in meaning. So encountered flags marks are not very similar to the plaintiff's alleged marks, Gin's marks, um, and it appears unlikely that the consumers will confuse them. As to the intent factor, given Gin's disassociation from the marks for the better part of three decades. What a fool. What a fool. Um, after three decades, Gin's argument that the defendant's selection of the flag marks was in bad faith is not persuasive. Aside from the three shows in 2003, Gin did not claim any connection to black flag and logo marks until after flag announced its tour plans in 2013. So Gin, Gin puts black flag back together and puts out an album merely for this case. And it doesn't even work. It gets thrown out. Even he just got so defeated in this situation. Even if it is ultimately determined that SST owns the marks, defendants have pr presented at least a, co a colorable argument and certainly some evidence of good faith belief that they, through some iteration 
of a partnership owner owned the marks. Wow. Um, the issue in the intent factor is whether defendant in adopting its mark intended to capitalize on Greg Ginn's goodwill. For these same reasons, Ginn's, uh, Ginn and SST have not shown a likelihood that they will succeed on their trademark cancellation claim. Interesting. Uh, a party may seek cancellation of a registered trademark on the basis of fraud. Blah, 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 blah. Uh, wait, wait, wait. Here's the last part here. Lastly, though evidence of actual confusion is not necessary to, fi uh, to a finding of likelihood of confusion, evidence of actual confusion among significant numbers of consumers provides a strong support for the likelihood of confusion. And then they said another case, Playboy enters versus Netscape. Um, here, plaintiffs only here, Greg Ginn's only evidence of actual confusion is Ginn's declaration that at one of his shows, fans asked him if he would be at an upcoming flag show, which probably made Greg Ginn really mad if it really happened. Such a such limited evidence hardly establishes actual confusion among a significant number of consumers. Furthermore, defendants point to extensive media coverage of this dispute, highlighting the differences between the two bands and thus decreasing the likelihood of consumer confusion. Nobody was confused about this. We all knew the difference and what we were getting. The similarity, intent, and actual confusion factors weigh heavily against the finding of likelihood confusion. Uh, though plaintiffs may ultimately be able to establish such a likelihood, at this stage, they have failed to demonstrate a likelihood of success on the merits sufficient to warrant injunction relief. Conclusion! For reasons stated above, the plaintiff's motion for preliminary injunction is denied in the court of Frumis. Case dismissed. Oh, <laughs> that's from a United States uh, district judge. Now, there was another document that looked very similar to this document. So I pulling it up, but we're not going to read it because I can't go through another thing. I'm like going to die. But let's very quickly. This was. There was also a, they also wanted to do a, a, a restraining order. There was a restraining order. Um, Greg Ginn and SST Records have sued Henry Rollins and all the, they sued all the guys for various trademark related claims, unfair competition. Um, I'm trying to find the blah, blah, blah. blah. Defendants except Garfield allegedly have advertised various concerts. Nope, nope, nope. But what does it say about temporary restraining order? I don't know why there would be two different things regarding irreparable harm. Uh, many of these cases considered. I'm not seeing why they... Here, let's do control find. Oops. The wrong one. <clears throat> Hold on. We should we should call this uh rock court, punk court. Let's see here. Restraining. Restraining. You're one of five. I'm just trying to find out where it says. Okay, here we go. Legal standard. Courts applied the preliminary injunction factors to uh deciding whether to grant a temporary restraining order. A, par a party requesting a temporary restraining order must establish that he's likely to succeed. I, I don't know how that why this needed its own separate document. I, I don't get it. I don't know. I don't know, man. Um, bottom line, they they smoked it. They they smoked they smoked him, man. They they went out as flag. They did a phenomenal job as flag. It was a great. Everybody loved it. I saw it live. I would go and see it live again if I had the ability to do so, or if they came back to my town, Greg Ginn in 2014 also got in trouble. He, he also got in trouble. Here's what, here's what, uh, here's what they both said about the lawsuit, by the way, Ginn says 
The dispute over Black Flag is not motivated by an effort to stop anyone from covering Black Flag songs. Quite the contrary. This dispute began when Henry Garfield and Keith Morris made an effort to hijack the name and the logo for their own use. No, for the Black Flag partnership. Behind everyone's back. No, just behind your back. But in, in regards to everybody, including you, in September of 2012, Garfield and Morris filed fraudulent trademark applications in which they are claiming to own the name and logo. Uh, had we not taken action, this pair could have snuck in these false applications to the trademark office, enabling them to stop Black Flag from playing and, get, and gaining exclusive use of the name and logo, except he had no interest in doing it until they were going to go out as flag. We were also trying to stop Morris and the others in his band from using the name and the logo in a misleading way. And then um, he goes on to say, they forced us to do this because not only do we need to bring an opposition to the trademark application, the trademark office, but we also need to bring what's called a cancellation action for cancellation of the existing mark for the four bars. Then we find out that they're also selling bootleg t-shirts, which was never substantiated. Here is what uh, Keith Morris said in response. We've done nothing wrong. Every step of the way, we've all talked to each other. We're all going to do this. We're not going to do that. We know what he is capable of doing, and we're not scared. We're not shaking in our shoes, and we're not going to be bullied. We'll just process forward. Uh, we live our lives, and whatever the outcome is, we're good guys, and we've done nothing wrong, so we really don't have to worry about anything. We are going to continue forward. We are going to continue forward until somebody – uh, that we deal with on a day-to-day -day basis tells us that we can't do it. When I saw them live, they did read from a statement. There was a statement that Keith Morris read from. You can see it. The video is online. Go look, go look up uh, "Flag Live" at Irving Plaza. It's pretty great. And uh, they put with 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 uh, with TSOL as well. TSOL said it's longer though. Uh, then in 2014. Uh, Black Flag's Greg Ginn was accused uh, of abuse um, of his kids by his ex-wife. And that was a whole thing. And really, I'm not going to read that here. And it was really sad to hear that stuff about Ginn. And I, I really hope it's not true. Somehow I have a feeling it is true. But um, just just terrible, truly. Just seems like a just a giant douchebag, honestly. In truth, genius or not, soul of black flag or not, who knows, man? Who friggin' knows? And um, that looks like it is it, Greg. Uh, here's what it looks like in legalese via flag. The court found that SST had no rights to the trademarks. Gin seemed to have no individual rights in the black flag trademarks. Even if either had any rights in those marks, they had abandoned those rights through a failure to police the mark for nearly 30 years. The defendants claimed that black flag assets were owned by a statutory partnership comprised of various former band members, even if these members only consisted of Henry and Ginn, based on A, accepting Ginn's argument that he never quit, and given that there is no evidence or allegation that Henry ever quit, has merit, meaning that all the way to this day for 30 years, and that's what I was going on about the, the semantics of it, is that technically Black Flag still existed in indefinite hiatus with Henry and Glenn being the remains of that Black Flag partnership that for, for Henry to suddenly make a move with the other members of, of, of Black Flag and file trademark stuff may morally be wrong in the sense of not morally morally is not the right word um by the set by the sense of band standards might be wrong but at the same time looking at how gin has screwed everybody over probably justified uh five the uh that even if the plaintiffs had some trademark claim in the marks gin there was no likelihood of consumer confusion at, right, we read this all in the legalese. This was someone broke it down in a much simpler way, and I should have just read this instead of reading the, the four, the four, <laughs> those four long up pages that I just read. Um, and that's it. That I am fucking. I guys, I am so tired. What a show! I haven't done a three and a half hour one tomorrow in a long time. Listen, tomorrow night we're gonna be back here. With um, whoa, Rue Morg, have you been here? <laughs> Rue Morg just quietly listening. He's been here the whole time. <laughs> Thank you, Rue. 
Thank you. Oh, man. Happy New Year, Ru. Good to see you, buddy. Hope you're well. Um, tomorrow night, I'm having uh, Joe Truck Casher from the Brain Eaters on. Um, they are putting out uh, their complete discography via Cleopatra Records. I'm very, very uh, happy for them. They're label mates with Morning Noise, Steve Zing's band, and, um, and Glenn Danzig, actually. Uh, Danzig. And um, that's going to be a really fun. That's 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 pizza punk. P uh, yes, I I do. I like the Grateful Dead. That's that's another story. I'm gonna. I don't want you guys to hate me, but I do. I like the Grateful Dead. Can't lie. Um, the uh, the that's going to be a lot of fun. That's tomorrow night. Here's here's a great reason to tune into the show, even if you don't know who the Brain Eaters are. Um, Joe was a fixture in the punk rock scene in the eighties in New York. And he saw the misfits play brain eaters also featured Damien. That was Damien's band right after Sam Hain. Um, Oh, you know, uh, Ace, you know, you know, uh, Joe, he's great. And, and thank you for tuning in. Hey, crazy white boy. What's up? Oh, good. You got, you got a lot to watch. <laughs> um, no, but Joe, Joe and I, I once told the story and we'll probably reminisce about it tomorrow. Joe and I drove down to locate we drove down to find Billy Rath from the Heartbreakers. That was an adventure that we road tripped together, uh, Joe and I, and we had a great time doing it. Joe is such he's a he's a he's a real character, and he talks even more than I do, if you could imagine it. He loves talking, and uh, I just have a feeling we're gonna hear a lot of great stories. And he was such such a nice dude. Like introduced me to like people. Um, he introduced me to a, a whole bunch of people like uh, Nick Martin from the stimulators. He just, just a really, really sweetheart of a guy. And uh, I, I just really can't wait to have him on the show. We have not seen each other in, in over 10 years. We've spoken on the phone a few times, uh, but yeah, but he has his whole, like I said, uh, Damien from Sam Hain, Pete, who was also on pizza punk as well. Uh, Pete uh, wrote some songs with him or, or played, played on some new brain eater songs. They're putting out the whole thing. So we want to raise awareness for this new release. I'm very excited. Uh, no more room in hell is finally coming out. That's the follow up to the, to the EP. If you want to read more about the brain eaters, you can actually read them about them on misfit central. There's a whole little entry. That's how I actually first found out about Joe. I think in any case, that's it. That's it for tonight. I, I, I thank you guys so much for sticking with me. I can't believe it's three and a half hours. It's one o'clock in the morning and there's still 32 people watching, which is really cool. Um, so yeah, I got lots of, lots of stuff coming this, this season, this month, just, uh, and Patreons, Patreons. I have Patreon videos. I promise they're coming. I'm trying to get some primo stuff for you. I'm trying to get some good stuff. Bear with me. It's supposed to be at the beginning of the month. I've been very good about that for the last six months. Uh, just got caught up. So, so, so thank you for your patience. My, my Patreons are, are, you know, lifeblood. So I, I want to make sure I do right by them. All you guys are lifeblood. Uh, what else can I say? Nothing. You know how we end the show here. We, I'm, I'm going to go watch the Boba Fett in bed. That's what I'm going to do. I need to like unwind. Uh, so I'm going to do that. And we have a wonderful way of saying goodbye. Oh, no. We go peace. No. What do I say? Peace and hair. No. Peace and hair grease. That's what I do. Sorry. It's, it's late. I'm burnt. I'm burnt. See you tomorrow. See you tomorrow. Patreon. Patreon. Hey, guys. What's going on? It's Jeff. So I've decided to make a Patreon. What is Patreon? I don't know how to define a Patreon. Let me look it up. Patreon is a membership platform that makes it very easy for creators to get paid for the things that they're already creating. I want to do it full time. I want this to be my full time job. In my efforts to make that happen, I've set up this platform. Is it going to work? Is it going to be successful? I don't know, but I would rather try and crash and burn than not try at all. The goal is to create enough passive revenue so that I can continue to do this full time uninterrupted. Why? Because I love to do this. I love creating content. I love making videos. I love shooting films. I love doing podcasts. In case you couldn't tell, I love to talk and I never shut the fuck up. <laughs> so right now I've kept the Patreon incredibly simple. There's two tiers and that may change in the future. The Murdergram is a simple way to extend support 
for all of the hours and hours of free content on the channel for nothing more than a dollar. 38 cents goes to Patreon. What's a buck 38, eh? It's less than a cup of coffee. But it's a great way that you can show support for very little effort. When you divide that dollar 38 by the hours and hours and hours of time spent listening to this endless drivel of content, the dollar cost average works out. Next up is the YouTube casualty for $6.66. The YouTube casualty is loaded to the gills. Enjoy the archive ad-free as well as ad-free early access to special docu-style podcast videos, music reaction commentaries, and the like a month before they drop on YouTube, loaded with ads, I might add. You're also going to get exclusive content and behind the scenes content that is not available on YouTube or anywhere else. So you get to peek behind the veil. And believe me, there's a couple of choice pieces. Most of all, more than anything, whether you join the Patreon or not, I just wanna thank each and every one of you that comes to the channel, that watches all the shows, that leaves comments, that participates, that subscribes, that's really the most important thing. This is just trying to find a way to earn a living as an artist. And with that, thank you for my TED Talk. Join the Patreon, because we need you! 66 cents.